Uh, the chair of the planning commission has previously determined that it is not practical or prudent for the planning commission and its committees to meet in person pursuant to Minnesota statute section 13D.02. Considering the COVID-19 health pandemic, it is not feasible for any member of the zoning. You're on mute. Okay. I'm sorry, can you're on mute? Chair, no. Chair, can, I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. You're on mute. <laughs> no, he's not. You're um, muted. <laughs> all right. Uh, just to make sure, mic check one, two. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can, we can hear you. Hear you. Oh. Chair, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, uh, committee members attending this meeting are doing so by telephone or other electronic means. It is also not feasible for members of the public to attend the meeting at its regular location due to the health pandemic and emergency. Arrangements have been made so that applicants and members of the public may also attend the meeting by telephone or other electronic means. Accordingly, no meeting is being held in City Hall Council Chambers at 15, uh, West Kellogg, 15, 15 West Kellogg Boulevard at this time. Again, this public hearing is being conducted remotely due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting is also being recorded. Even though this hearing is being conducted remotely, the committee's public hearing rules and procedures still apply as if the committee were meeting in its usual place. These rules and procedures are as follows. The zoning committee's recommendations and findings must have a rational basis based upon the St. Paul zoning code and applicable state and federal laws. The zoning committee's actions today are recommendations. They are not final decisions. The committee's recommendations are forwarded to the planning commission for final action. The committee's recommendations will be considered by the full planning commission at its regular meeting held one week from Friday. The planning commission's meeting is open to the public, but it is not a public hearing. The decision of the planning commission on conditional use permits, non-conforming use permits, site plans, variances, and other zoning permits are final decisions unless appealed to the City Council. The decisions of the Planning Commission on rezoning applications are only recommendations. By state law, the City Council, following a public hearing before it, makes the final decision on rezoning applications. Uh, the following rules and procedures govern today's public hearing of the Zoning Committee. The chair will call the secretary to uh, take attendance by the committee. Committee members will need to respond verbally for the record. For our committee members during the meeting, please mute your microphones except when uh, recognized by the chair to speak. Discussion is intended for committee members and staff only, except during public hearing um, items when the chair invites individuals to speak. Staff will be monitoring microphones and muting committee members and members of the public as needed. Use the team's chat function only to indicate that you have a question or comment. The chat function is part of the official uh, meeting recording. Type Q or question into the chat feature when you have a question and or see or comment if you have a comment. The chair and staff will monitor the chat function so that the chair may recognize committee members and staff in an orderly way. After being recognized by the chair, committee members should state their name before speaking. This helps others in the meeting and assists with the official recording. When the chair calls the committee to vote on agenda items, the secretary will call to do a roll call. Committee members must respond verbally for the record and vote either yes or no. Cases will be called in the order they appear on the agenda and uh, the chair reserves the right to limit the length of testimony if deemed necessary. I ask the recording secretary to now conduct a roll call of the committee members that are present for this meeting. Each committee member should acknowledge their presence by saying here. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner DeJoy? Here. Commissioner Grill? Here. Commissioner Hood? Here. Commissioner Rangel Morales? Here. Commissioner Riley? Here. Commissioner Said? Here. And Commissioner Tegioff? Here. All present. Thank you. Um, if you are a member of the public that would like to speak during the specific items public hearing, you will be asked to identify yourself at the appropriate time. The public shall not use the chat for communicating public testimony as it is not considered part of the public record. After I read um, the, the name uh, and title, 
Uh, staff will give an oral report on the item for the agenda, and then I will open up the floor for committee members to ask questions of staff. After that, I will open the public hearing on the item. All testimony and questions will be addressed to the chair. You may speak in favor or in opposition, and you will be limited to no more than two minutes. Please, uh, people who exceed the time limit may have their microphones muted by staff. I will first ask the testimony from those in favor and then from those in opposition. You must provide your name and address for the public record. Please mute yourself during this meeting, except during the two minutes when you are specifically called upon to speak. You are allowed to speak only once, with the exception of the applicant, who will be allowed an opportunity to respond to the testimony and answer committee questions. Uh, moving forward, I will now entertain a motion for the approval of the. June 3rd uh, zoning committee minutes. And uh, I see Commissioner Saeed. Yes, Chair uh, Commissioner Saeed, I move to approve on June 3rd. Thank you, zone Commissioner. Committee. Thank you, Commissioner Saeed. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Commissioner DeJoy, second. Thank you, Commissioner DeJoy. I have a second. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, um, let's vote, please. Commissioner DeJoy? Yes. Commissioner Grill? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Commissioner Ringo Morales? Yes. Commissioner Riley? Yes. Commissioner Tegia? Yes. Commissioner Said? Yes. And Chair Baker? Yes. Eight in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, that motion passes. Moving on to site plan review. Uh, the site plan review committee meeting scheduled for Tuesday, July 6 has been canceled. There are no agenda items uh, for that meeting at this time. That takes us into our first and um, only um, agenda item for today. Uh, 695 Grand rezoning, rezoning from B2 Community Business District and EG East Grand Avenue Overlay District to T3 Traditional Neighborhood District without the EG East Grand Overlay District. Um, I will now, um, I think we have Ms. Sigworth, that will be coming to us for a presentation. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Baker and committee members. Uh, so the case I have for you today is 695 Grand Avenue. The application is to rezone from B2 and East Grand Avenue Overlay District to T3 without the East Grand Overlay District. All right, looking at the location, uh, 695 Grand is a commercial building with a parking lot located at the northwest corner of Grand Avenue and St. Albans Street. Uh, to the north, we have uh, condominiums and single family homes. To the east, uh, condominiums. To the south, uh, the land use is um, multifamily residential and um, mixed use commercial and residential. And then to the west, um, multifamily residential. Uh, this, the site is zoned uh, B2 community business and within the East Grand Overlay District, as you can see here. Um, to the north, we have RT2 Townhouse District. To the east and west um, is RM2, Medium Density Multifamily Residential District. And to the south is uh, RM2 and uh, B3 General Business. Looking at the surrounding properties, uh, here we have the, sorry, we have the, uh, the condos and the single family buildings. This is a picture of the condo. Uh, to the east, we have, um, three-story condos. To the south, we have multifamily. And um, west, we also have multifamily here. The history of the site uh, was originally developed for residential use in the early 1900s. It was developed into its current configuration of a commercial building and parking lot, and was occupied by, commercial, by grocery stores uh, from 1966 to 1978, when the building was renovated and occupied by restaurants. And then in the 1980s to the 2000s, the current owner and his family purchased the property and the two restaurant tenants that still exist today. In 2016, another restaurant was added. And then in terms of the uh, East Grand Avenue Overlay District, um, 
the city council adopted the East Grand Overlay District and uh, the property was, re was rezoned as part of the district in July, 2006. All right, here are some photos of the current site. Um, it's 36,005 square feet. There is a uh, one story commercial building with three restaurants on the Western half and a large parking lot on the side on the site's uh, Eastern half. And then there's an alley that runs along the Northern property line. All right, so finding one, uh, the applicant owns the property occupied by the service parking lot and the one story building. The applicant is proposing to, to develop a five story mixed use building with four ground floor commercial spaces, uh, 80 market rate apartments, 80 secure bicycle parking spaces, 99 vehicular uh, parking stalls. And the site is located in a mixed use area along Grant Avenue that has a mix of commercial and residential uses, as well as a mix of housing types and sizes. Uh, Metro Transit operates Route 66, sorry, Route 63, bus route along Grand Avenue. There's a block, there's a stop one block east at Grand and Dale, and then Route 65 that runs along Dale Street. Uh, the Summit Avenue Bikeway is part of the original bike, bicycle transportation network that's located one block north. All right, this is the uh, proposed level one plan. I don't want to get too much into the building because this is just for the rezoning and then um, additional variances and the cup are going to be at the next zoning committee meeting. But here you can see the level one plan um, showing the four commercial spaces here, um, an outdoor patio and access um, from Grand and then out to um, St. Albans. Here are the proposed uh, building renderings. Uh, I'm sure the developer will show you more, but these are the views along Grand, St. Albans, um, the patio and and from the from the corner along the, the alleyway here and um, at the corner of um, St. Albans and Grand. All right, finding two, the proposed building would have a footprint of about 30,500 uh, square feet, a height of 59 feet, 10 inches, a total floor area of 108 square feet, excluding parking, and an FAR of 3.0. Um, the current B2 zoning allows a height of 30 feet plus additional height based on setbacks and an FAR of 2.0. Um, and the current East Grand Avenue Overlay District restricts uh, footprints to 25,000 square feet, building size above ground to 75,000 square feet, uh, height to 36 feet for mixed use buildings. And uh, that's with no additional height based on setbacks. Finding two continued, uh, the proposed T3 zoning allows building heights of 55 feet plus Additional height based on setbacks, um, but 25 feet plus setbacks um, from the rear property line where it is adjacent to um, RT2 townhouse district. Uh, also additional height uh, with a conditional use permit and a maximum FAR of 3.0. So this application for rezoning is to provide for the development of the new, of the proposed new um, five-story mixed use building. All right, finding three, uh, the permitted height of 55 feet plus additional height based on setbacks and additional height with a cup uh, that's permitted in the T3 district is, is consistent with the permitted building height of 50 feet plus additional height with a cup uh, allowed in the adjacent RM2 districts, uh, which, is, which are located um, southeast and west of the property. Finding four, uh, the proposed T3 zoning is consistent with the way that this area has developed. Uh, traditional neighborhood districts are intended to foster the development and growth of compact pedestrian mixed housing, commercial development, uh, compatible mix of commercial and residential uses within sites of uh, buildings and blocks, and uh, new development in proximity to major transit streets and corridors. And uh, the T3 district is designed to provide for higher density pedestrian and transit oriented mixed use development including on uh, smaller sites in an existing mixed-use neighborhood where uh, commercial and residential uses are already in close proximity to each other. Um, and there's a mix of housing styles, types, and sizes to accommodate households of varying sizes, ages, and incomes that already exist within this uh, walking distance. This part of Grand Avenue is a, an example of a mixed-use transit street in St. Paul. It has a mix of housing types and densities, um, shops, smaller, larger retail stores, restaurants, and services. The increased building height with density allowed in the T3 district is consistent with this particular location where there are a number of higher density apartment buildings with heights in the 40 to 50 range and a, and a six story, approximately 65 foot high condominium building 
uh, located one flock to the west. All right, finding five. Uh, proposed T3 zoning is consistent with the land use chapter of the comprehensive plan. Uh, the future land use of this property is part of a mixed use area along Grand, and our comprehensive plan defines uh, mixed use areas as areas that are primarily along thoroughfares well served by transit. The main distinguishing characteristic is the balance of jobs and housing within walking distance of one another. Historically, these areas are developed in easily accessible locations, and they will continue to be the most dynamic areas of St. Paul. Uh, so these areas are vital for the ongoing, ongoing growth and econ economic development of the city by providing the highest densities outside of downtown. Uh, so policy LU27, um, this is providing for land use change and rezoning of land adjacent to mixed use areas to allow for commercial redevelopment and expansion along arterial streets. Uh, so the proposed rezoning allows for commercial redevelopment to a mixed use development with structured parking that is financially feasible at five stories along Green Avenue, a roadway that is designated as an arterial street in the transportation plan. All right, finding five continued. Um, LU, policy LU1, which is encouraged encourage transit sort of density and direct majority of growth to areas with high, higher density and um, highest density or planned transit ca capacity. The proposed zoning allows for a higher density mixed use development that supports the existing transit that's on Grand Avenue and Dale. Um, policy LU14, this has reduced the amount of land devoted to off-street parking in order to use land more efficiently, accommodate increases in density, um, and promote the use of transit and other non-car mobility modes. The existing site is currently an underutilized, is currently under, underutilized, um, with a one-story commercial building and a large service parking lot covering half the site. The T3 zoning that's proposed allows for a higher density mixed use development in an area that is well served by transit and is highly walkable and bikeable uh, that will use the land much, much more efficiently. Then at policy LU6, foster equitable and uh, sustainable economic growth by facilitating business creation, attraction, retention, expansion. Uh, the proposed building uh, will retain the existing local businesses as well as facilitate business creation with the development of two new commercial spaces. Finding six, uh, the proposed T3 zoning is consistent with the housing chapter of the comprehensive plan. Uh, policy H46 support the development of new housing, particularly in areas identified as mixed use um, and or in areas with highest existing or planned transit capacity to meet the market demands for living in a walkable uh, transit accessible neighborhood. The proposed zoning allows for the development of new housing in a mixed use area to allow more residents to live in the walkable transit accessible urban neighborhood that is along the Grand Avenue corridor. Finding seven, the proposed T3 zoning is consistent with the 2006 uh, Summit Hill District 16 neighborhood plan. Policy G1 um, is maintain Grand Avenue as a continuous neighborhood retail and residential corridor contain commercial uses and parking within existing boundaries. The proposed zoning allows for Grand Avenue to be maintained as a continuous retail and residential corridor with an active mixed use commercial and residential building and contains uh, the proposed development and the parking within the existing boundaries. Uh, the proposed development also provides continuous street frontage at the corner of Grand and St. Albans. Policy G3, uh, this is adopt TN2 design standards for East Grand and Overlay District. Uh, these standards reinforce human scale, promote quality and architectural materials, reinforce pedestrian focused street, streetscape, promote underground parking and um, visually screened service parking, and um, promote signage that's consistent with the building architecture. Uh, so the proposed T3 zoning maintains these T2 design standards uh, because they also apply in the, in the T3 district. Policy G7, locally owned businesses, uh, is SHA recommends implementing mechanisms for supporting and retaining small locally owned businesses. The proposed zoning allows for a local business owner to maintain as well as expand their business and facilitate local business creation with the development of two new commercial spaces uh, for small businesses. Uh, finding eight, the proposed rezoning out of the East Grand Overlay District is not consistent with the 2006 Summit Hill District 16 neighborhood plan. Uh, because policy G10 states adopt limitations of the height and scale on new buildings on East Grand Avenue and Overlay District as follows. Um, 
This is limiting buildings to the footprint of 25,000 square feet, limiting uh, the building size 20 to 75,000 square feet, um, building height to three, three stories or 30 feet or 36 um, for mixed use commercial. And no additional height is allowed based on setbacks or even with setbacks. Um, so while the Summit Hill Association is currently in the process of updating their neighborhood plan and uh, considering potential changes to the East Grand Avenue Overlay District, the language in this plan is currently in effect. All right, finding nine. Uh, proposed T3 zoning is compatible with the surrounding uses, which includes uh, retail, restaurants, service businesses, medium density residential um, that are all permitted in the T3 district, district and is compatible with the transit corridor that runs along Green Avenue. Uh, T3 zoning includes the same um, traditional neighborhood design standards that apply to the surrounding properties that are within the East Grand Avenue overlay district. Finding 10, uh, court rulings have determined that spot zoning is illegal in Minnesota. Uh, so Minnesota ha courts have stated that this term applies to zoning changes, typically limited to small plots of land, which establish a use classification inconsistent with the surrounding uses and create an island of non-conforming use within a larger zoned property. The uses that are permitted under the, under the proposed T3 zoning are similar to the residential uses permitted in the adjacent RM2 medium density multifamily res residential districts that are located southeast and west of the property. They are also similar to the commercial uses that are permitted in B2 and B3 districts on this block of Grand Avenue. And they are similar to the uh, uses, the commercial and residential uses permitted in, in the um, OS and BC community business districts that are also located along Grand. So uh, while the East Grand Avenue Overlay District provides traditional neighborhood district design standards that also apply in T3 and uh, building height, size, and footprint limits, uh, it does not establish a use classification. So the proposed zoning to T3 without the East Grand Avenue Overlay District would not establish a use classification inconsistent with the surrounding uses it would be consistent with the surrounding land uses and zoning that would not be spot zoning. All right, so the District 16 Summit Hill Association recommendation, they recommended approval of the proposed rezoning from B2 community business to T3 traditional neighborhood. They recommended denial of the proposed rezoning out of the East Grand Avenue overlay district. And they recommended that the applicant seek exceptions from the overlay district regulations including building height footprint and overall size through the variance process. Uh, for the letters received from the public, uh, the Summit Hill Association forwarded all the letters that they received both before and after their public hearing. And the city also received uh, many letters as well as a petition and opposition with over 400 signatures. Uh, we were very careful not to count anyone's vote more than once as some people sent multiple letters or signed the petition in addition to sending one or more letters. Uh, so the total number of letters in support is 47, and the total number of letters in opposition is 481, which includes the petition signers who did not already send a letter. Uh, so the main concerns for those in opposition include the height and massing of the building, the compatibility with the historic neighborhood, the potential parking and traffic issues, and uh, increased density. All right, based on the findings, staff recommends approval of the proposed rezoning from B2 community business to T3 traditional neighborhood for the property at 695 Grand Avenue. Based on finding eight, uh, staff recommends denial of the, of the proposed rezoning out of the East Grand Avenue overlay district for the property at 695 Grant. And I can take any questions. Thank you so much um, for that very thorough presentation. I'll turn it over to my colleagues at this time. Any questions from Ms. Sigworth? Uh, Commissioner Grill. Hi, Ms. Sigworth. Um, for the letters and support and opposition, that was overall support and opposition to the project, not the individual elements, so not um, B2 to T3 specifically, but to all of the elements in the project. Is that correct? Um, yes, uh, Commissioner Grill, yes. So it, it was difficult to um, 
to sort out which ones were just for the rezoning because everybody was was talking about the development in general. So I would say overall, um, there were some that specifically mentioned just this case, rezoning case, but um, mostly everybody was talking about the development in general, which included you know the variances and the rezoning and the cut. All right, I Thanks, see. Chair. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Commissioner Grill. I see Commissioner Riley and then Commissioner Rangel Morales. Thank you, Chair Baker. Um, thank you, Ms. Seagriff. Uh, question, two questions. Um, one is a follow-up, I guess, from Commissioner Grills, which is, can you restate the number of supporters versus opposers? Th thank you, put it back up. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, and then secondly, I, it's not exactly relevant to the rezoning per se, um, but there's no mention of the fact that this property is located within the, the state designated historic district um, in this staff report at all. Um, and I'm curious if you could address why that information is not included and let us know what kind of consultation has happened with um, staff to the Heritage Preservation Commission. Um, oh. Uh, before before Ms. Sigwart uh, answers that uh, answer that question, uh, Commissioner Riley, I'm glad you brought that up. I just want to highlight to uh, my fellow commissioners, and I think that Commissioner Riley did a good job. Uh, but I just want to highlight that um, the focus for us today is really focusing on uh, the rezoning effort. This is not the conditional use permit. This is not the variances. Um, so I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. So when you are asking questions, you may want to, and I know we all want to know more information about uh, this project. So I am not saying don't do that, but I just want to make sure that um, we all are clear on kind of our focus today. So sorry about that. Uh, uh, Ms. Sigward. Um, thanks, Chair Baker and Commissioner Riley. Um, yes, that, that is true. It, it, is, it is within um, historic, um, district boundaries, and um, it was not mentioned in the staff report uh, just because that there isn't a spot for it. And um, and, and and next time, um, that, that seems to be something that's of, of interest, and that will definitely be added next time. So I apologize for not including that. Um, and I, I have talked to Heritage Preservation staff previously a few months ago about this project, and um, I do believe that it has to go through Heritage Preservation um committee and um i believe that the the development the development team could talk more about this but i believe that they have possibly started that process um but i'm sorry that i don't have more information on that but that is what i believe i appreciate it thank you very much thank you uh commissioner Rangel morales so uh, my question has to do with um uh, sigward's comments and then commissioner ba uh, chair baker's kind of um, uh, guiding us as to what we're doing here today. And because there are so many comments and the comments were uh, unable to be deciphered as to what applies to the matter with regards to the rezoning and what regards to the CUP, um, I, I don't, I, what, what, what does that do for the public comments? I mean, um, there, th given that there was a lot of input in it with the idea that we would be hearing the rezoning and also the CUP and the variances, it seems almost inappropriate that, you know, those weren't parsed out to, so that we could decide the issue before today with the comments relevant for today. Um, so I'm just concerned about that. Um, Commissioner Rangel Morales, I think I understand what you're saying. I what I don't want to do in this meeting um, is actually focus on items that I don't want to focus on items and lead the public in a direction um, that ultimately the, the, the committee isn't focused on or aren't going to vote on. So my concern is that we start to discuss and talk through um, CUP, different areas and variances, setbacks, those different things. And to me, that is not the decision that is at hand. The decision that is at hand is rezoning. So maybe to get there, if there 
um, if if committee members um, think it would be helpful um, and maybe you can ask the question, but um, maybe staff could give us some direction or some insight so the public knows what's at hand, because I just want to make sure that we're not going into conversation or discussions that ultimately will not be truly voted on. Um, I see Commissioner Riley. Sorry, so many buttons. Thanks, Chair Baker. Um, and uh, to Commissioner Rangel Morales's point, I, my question takes us back to the rezoning. So if you indulge me on my second question, maybe we can make sure that we stick to questions that are related directly to um, the zoning classification uses, et cetera, um, as we're moving forward. So that's kind of where my line of questioning for staff is right now. And, and my question is, um, was there any conversation about um, rezoning to T2 instead of T3 um, and if that was I don't know if the staff wants to address that or when we hear from the applicant but I do have that's another question that I have which is directly related to the rezoning thank you oh, thanks thanks Commissioner Riley um, Ms. Sigward did you want to respond to that or do you think it would be appropriate for the applicant And if you're talking, oh, we can't hear you. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Um, so that, that was discussed in the early conversations, and I, I do believe that that was their original um, proposal when they had first, first shown the drawings. Um, they can talk more about this too. But um, because of their, their height, um, it was recommended that they went with T3 because if they went with, uh, with T2, they would need um, some, some height, additional height. Um, Conditional use permits or, or variances, um, so that their height was greater than 55, so that made sense to to kind of bump it up into T3. Okay. Thank you. No follow-up questions. Um, I see Commissioner Grill. I just want to say that if I am not calling on you, it's because um, at this time it is for uh, uh, commissioners, and the public will have an opportunity. Um, to speak during the public hearing uh, a little later on on this agenda item. Uh, Commissioner Grill. Thanks, Chair. Um, so my question is about the staff recommendation. So I understand the B2 to T3 traditional neighborhood and what the process is for that. Um, my question is around rezoning out of the East Grand over Avenue overlay district. Um, just because we haven't had very many of those in front of us before, I'm wondering if staff can just clarify the process that would that we would go through if the committee recommended um, or forwarded along the staff recommendation. Um, yes, uh, Commissioner Grell. Um, so it's my understanding that um, this is treated very similarly to a, a normal rezoning. Um, and I, I was just looking at the process for um, for when it was rezoned or when it was zoned into the overlay district. And it was it was the same process as a rezoning. Um, so that's my understanding. And I don't know if any other staff has anything else to add on that. OK. Um, any uh, all right, I see. Oh, well, first, let me go to Commissioner Grid. Did you want to follow up on that? So I did. I think the director might be preemptively answering my second question, <laughs> um, but my, my question is really around. So say we do um, follow the staff recommendation and we recommend denial of the proposed rezoning out of the East Grand Overlay District. Um, my question is, does the applicant then have an opportunity to come back to us through this same process um, with the variance instead of the um, rezoning? Ms. Sigward, would you mind answering that if you can? Um, yes, so that is the reason, Commissioner Grell, that, that is the reason why um, they have requested a continuance on the um, on their variances and their cup application um, because they are adding kind of this other path um, for for variances to um, to the East Grand Avenue Overlay District. So um, so they will have that opportunity. Um, they've applied for it, and that and that will be at the next um, zoning committee meeting. 
Um, Director Prayer, I saw your hand. Did you want to add anything to that? Not substantially. I think Emma answered it, but you know, just to kind of go back to Commissioner Grill's uh, question, the way I kind of think about it is, this is sort of you know the site has both the underlying B two zoning and then it has the overlay, which is more restrictive, and they both apply. So um, that that's kind of why I think the initial idea was, you know, if you're rezoning to T three, which allows for greater height and greater FAR, and more in line with what this this project is. Um, at the same time, why not consider a rezoning to remove it from the overlay? Uh, sort of that was the thinking I think behind the app, this applicant's uh, initial uh, application. But certainly, you know, the alternative here is, um, you know, what, where where staff landed and and also where um, I believe the neighborhood and um, the applicant I, th I believe they're agreeable to this is looking at variances um, instead. Uh, you know, to look at the specific. Uh, zoning standards that are uh, in the overlay that uh, would make, you know, uh, would be a, a little bit challenging, I suppose, uh, for um, for this project. Uh, so specifically the the three items that um, that Emma mentioned uh, related to uh, building footprint, um, total building square footage and uh, maximum height. Uh, so the overlay again is more restrictive and, and that's why um, uh, they would be doing that. So Director Perry, just just to have you since you're since you just spoke on that, I'm interested um, in the staff report. It talked about how um, there may be changes, potential changes coming um, to the overlay district, and um, only because it was in the staff report, I'm interested in um, when you think um, that will actually take place. Um, our um, do you have a certain time frame in mind or are you all just kind of working on it and you'd be able to report back later? Um, Chair, I, I think Emma might know better than me and I will I will answer from what I know, but certainly would stand to be corrected with better information and, and, and probably um, uh, others like uh, Commissioner Tagiev may know better as well. I've I've heard that, you know, the, the, the ongoing um, update to the District 16 plan is, is is an open sort of question um, meetings and sort of various research and analysis going on including looking at the overlay I, I, I think I read somewhere that um, the summit hill was going to try to get a recommendation on the overlay by um, next year maybe in the summer maybe mm -hmm. around this time but I, I'm not totally sure if that's the latest and greatest on timing okay I see Commissioner thank you. Thank you. yes I wanted to uh uh, so that the director prayer is correct. Um, so the uh, Summit Hill Association has been involved in the neighborhood plan process that started last year, um, and they are looking at updating the 10 year plan. Um, the commitment on the, the commitment is to review the East Grand Avenue overlay district in detail um, and look at sort of ways that can be changed. Um, the, the commitment made in the in the uh, in the letter submitted to this hearing was the 1st of June 2022 at the very latest there will be a recommendation and the association is hopeful that the recommendation coming before that date. Okay. You me? All right. Um, any other questions or comments for staff? From my colleagues. All right, if none, I'll move forward and um, I'll call up the applicant. Uh, would you like to add anything at this time um, to the presentation? Um, if so, please state your name and address uh, for the record. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, terrific. My name is Ari Peretz. My address is 1026 Portland Avenue, and I am a developer with Reuter Walton Development, the development. Uh, development team leading the uh, project at 695 grand. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to uh, staff for the complete presentation and for all the work that they've put into evaluating the project thus far. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners, for hearing us today. And thank you to the folks from the Summit Hill Association who have spent the past five months with our project team reviewing it, um, giving us comments, uh, some small changes, some large changes, and ultimately supporting the project um, as of the, the board meeting almost a couple weeks ago. So I just 
want to get those thanks out the door uh, before I add some additional comments. Um, Joel, do you want to pull up the presentation just to have uh, that showing? And you could keep it on the cover page just for a minute. That. Nah. Yep. Thanks. Um, so first of all, I uh, I just want to address you know a, a couple big elephants in the room. Um, we from the day that we started this, actually going back years, we we understood uh, pretty significantly what the community's hot button issues were. And, and again, I'm going to focus on rezoning for now. We we can save the uh, uh, specific height and variance issues for a couple weeks from now. But we we understood that the neighborhood and the city was was focused on the design, the scale, the overall. What? You need to miss power. Um, can't, I think we lost the applicant. So, sorry about that, Chair. I got a I got a notification saying that I had been muted, so I had to just star six myself unmuted. Oh, sorry. Can everybody still hear me? That's yeah. okay. Um, if I talk, it, I'm not muting myself. It's the system. <laughs> Um, uh, so where was I thinking about the, the design scale and experience on Grand and how could we design a project that fit into what Grand has been for the last 100, 120 years and what Grand uh, we hope will be for the next 100 or 120 years. And also working to develop a project that was itself developable. We didn't find a lot of sense in designing something that we knew we'd never be able to build or that anybody would never be able to build. So we tried to find the intersection of those two things and the intersection of those two things is wh what you have in front of you. Uh, five months of community engagement um, that involved a series of different public meetings that we held um, and hosted as the development team, a series of public meetings that the Summit Hill Association and their Zoning and Land Use Committee hosted um, that we participated in and then culminating in the Summit Hill Association's board vote on the 17th really shaped this project and worked to smooth out um, any of the rough edges that were there by no intent uh, right when we got started. But um, I think through that collective input have created a project that we're all proud of and that ultimately um, we know the neighborhood supports because as uh, Emma uh, shared earlier, you have the letter of support from the Summit Hill Association uh, board in front of you. And we know that that support is not unanimous across the community, full, fully recognized. Um, and we understand the um, emotions and the real life experiences that are driving some of that, um, some of that uh, inconsistency or some of the lack of support, I'll say. And we feel them too, we're, we're not, uh, foreign or, or alien to this community. We live in the community ourselves. We have businesses in the community ourselves. We understand what all of these issues are just as well as as folks who live, you know, within a block or so of this project. But at the same time, we feel that through the engagement that we've done, we've reflected those concerns in every uh, feasible way. And we're committed to continuing to reflect those concerns through hopefully the creation of this project through its construction and through its operation to be good neighbors and to be um, a really productive and exciting new anchor on Grand to deliver something new to the community that hasn't had a project like this in almost 20 years um, and to serve as a model for what new projects and the engagement processes that they go through can be. We understand, and I'm sure you'll hear from many of the folks who will participate in the public comment, that there is an element of the community that would like a shorter building, that would like something that is strictly compliant with underlying zoning, strictly compliant with the East Grand Overlay, capped at three stories, and still have you know a mixed-use element and, and all of the other nice features that we see here. And we, we get that. Um, there are buildings from 100 years ago on Grand that have a similar, a similar character, and we understand where that's coming from. At the same time, we also understand that it is not feasible. And we feel like the history of the last 20 years of development in the East Grand Overlay District um, proved that. It's not just us saying we can't make it work on this site. We've 
spent a lot of time observing precedent developments in the area and not found a single one that is strictly compliant with what the East Grand Overlay conditions are. So we, as we sit here in 2021, we said, okay, we, we understand what the overlay conditions are. It's not that we're ignoring them or insensitive to them. We understand what the city's broader priorities are with the 2040 plan and all of the supporting policies that uh, staff mentioned in their report. Where can we bring those two things together? What do we think has some room to give? What do we think has some room to grow? And that's, that's where we've landed. Um, to address the variance versus rezone question, which I know came up uh, from a few commissioners during uh, staff comment and staff Q&A, we are um, uh, willing to be flexible on the technical route that we take through either a rezone out of the East Grand Overlay District, which was our initial preference, it was our initial application, or uh, seek exceptions from the overlay through a variance process, which we know to be the Summit Hill Association's preference. Whichever one of those um, uh, commissioners you would like us to take, we are okay taking, um, because fundamentally we believe that this building through its T3 zoning and through um, the various other applications that will follow uh, are very, very, very much in the spirit of what exists on Grand today and what the future guidance for Grand is through the 2040 plan and its mixed use designation. Um, the final thing I'll say, and then uh, certainly happy to answer uh, as many questions as there are, is, is just to address one of staff's comments on heritage preservation. We, we did commission a historic study of the site um, two or three years ago through a well-known um, uh, preservation specialty firm. And that, that firm concluded that there is nothing historically relevant of the site today. It, you know, the brick is, is sort of nice. It's was built in the 1960s as a grocery store. Nothing else that exists on the site predates the construction of the grocery store. Um, so we took that and we, we've never heard anything from staff to the contrary that we would be subject to any kind of additional HPC uh, or other historic review. So I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone's on the same page. We are, we are not simultaneously pursuing um, uh, anything related to preservation because we didn't understand that that to be an, an applicable um, uh, thing for us to do. I'll pause there and okay. happy to answer questions. Thank you. Um, can you say your uh, last name again? Paris. P A R R I T Z. Yep. Paris. Thank you, Mr. Paris. Um, to my colleagues, any questions for Mr. Paris? While they are. Um, formulating anything. I had a question. So I know that you have met and had conversations with the community and also well, in in your um, short presentation, you said that you connected with the community, you engaged with the community for around five months. That also included with um, Summit Hill Association. I'm interested on any substantial changes for the initial proposal of the project to what we see now based on the engagement with uh, the community and also through Summit Hill Association. Could you just highlight um, any initial, uh, some of those things that have changed? Absolutely, yep, Joel, thanks. If you if you full, first pull up slide four, thanks. So when we first met with the community, uh, Mr. Chair, these six items listed on the left were kind of broad themes that we heard uh, from the community that we should pay more attention to if they felt like we didn't weren't paying enough or things that they felt needed to be improved um, as the project moved through its conceptual design. And every single one of these things has been addressed from the point when we started to where we are today. We totally changed where traffic parking and access functioned around the site with input both from the immediate neighbors and neighborhood broadly as well as um, Public Works and PED, and I we have a uh, just Joel. Do you want to go to the next slide, uh, slide five, just to illustrate that while I'm talking about it? This is six of what were probably twelve different site plans that changed access points to try to find what was going to create the least amount of congestion and what was going to create the safest pedestrian and bicycle uh, experience, and at the same time, you know. Be functional for the building have appropriate um, 
access both for our residents to get into the garage and down to the lower level for their parking as well as for our commercial tenants to get into the parking that we have on grade and be able to get out without creating any many major pinch points. Um, we, we relocated the loading access, which you can see on the upper left um, site plan, was behind the site along the alley. We pulled that totally off the alley and moved it to the street. And that was in response to some, some major concern expressed from the neighbors who live along the alley and you know what the addition, what the current truck traffic is, what the future truck traffic would be, and what the additional vehicular uh, um, car-based traffic would be for our residents and for commercial tenants. So now there's no access point on the alley and there's no loading on the alley. So we think that traffic is now routed to um, the least intrusive uh, points possible. And this was sort of the absolute best that the project could support after all the different rounds of review that we did. Um, so Joel, if you go back to slide four, thank you. So retail loading I just covered. Uh, third retail space needs was helping us find ways to program the parts of the retail space that weren't already programmed. So one of the defining features of this project is that two of the three restaurants that currently operate at 695 grand are going to close for a period of time through construction and then reopen to anchor the retail space, which is a highly unusual um, feature of any new, de new development project. Typically, this, this sort of retail space is what we would call speculative, meaning you don't have an identified tenant before you break ground and start the project. We have over half of our space project known and committed known and committed through one of our project partners uh, who owns and operates Emmett's uh, Public House in Sagia. Dixie's is being um, retired and is not reopening, but we have this, what we call dream space, which you can see on the, the lower right-hand corner of the project. That's something that doesn't yet have a defined use that we felt like was a unique opportunity to bring in the neighborhood into helping us conceive of what could be a really nice uh, use for that space. And that, brought us into a, a collaboration discussion with the Neighborhood Development Center to find out if there was opportunities to bring in um, BIPOC entrepreneurs or other people who were a part of the Neighborhood Development Center ecosystem or, or direct programming to bring them into Grand and to help them uh, add their own spin and their own value onto this space too and be able to sort of trail off of the existence of anchor tenants. So not having to open a brand new place in a brand new building that didn't have anything else around it you already have, you know, really, really, really strong co-tenancy with established restaurants. How could somebody else benefit from, from that established space? And then one of the final things that we did with the retail space is we added this um, retail space number four, which is just over a thousand square feet, as of, which came out of all of the different configurations that we did for the site plan, which presents an opportunity for somebody maybe who's just getting a start to take on less, less of a financial burden with a smaller space and be able to do something a little bit more creative. And we're also talking to, with the Neighborhood Development Center about that space as well, whether that's a place for um, startup entrepreneurs to have sort of a pop-up that rotates seasonally or you know, at some other frequency um, and takes advantage of kind of its small size, but also its adjacency to, to more established um, businesses. So that's the, the ground floor and the third space retail needs. We tweaked the unit mix uh, just a bit to enable um, a mix that supported large, a little bit larger units than what we had initially um, designed as a means to better position the building to accommodate the needs of the neighborhood broadly and not just young professionals, as an example, to really be able to accommodate the needs of folks who live in the neighborhood today, maybe in one of the historic houses and are ready to downsize, but don't have any other uh, new product to move into. It enables them to move, stay in their neighborhood where they love to live, presumably, and make their home available for somebody else to move into. So enabling more efficiency in the movement and the turnover of the housing stock was another thing um, that these larger units enabled. Um, improving the safety along the alley and along Grand, uh, this should say, being able to bring more eyes onto the street was a huge part of, of our focus and, and ways that we continually strive to improve the project, activating the plaza area um, in between the two existing restaurants and putting in a public art feature um, to really signify the, the investment for the project and the investment for the community. 
Okay. Generally make this area feel, feel more safe. And then the final was how the exterior of the building was designed and how it fit into the context of the neighborhood. And the changes that we made here manifested themselves in a variety of different ways that include really, really, really strong architectural treatment of the entire building, but specifically these corner anchors and how this building related to the condominiums on the east side of St. Albans and the condominiums on, the, on St. Albans to the north of us along the alley, trying to drive some consistency there. And we, we put a lot of design focus in making sure that those transitions happened appropriately. And then most significantly was something that we were able to accommodate um, sort of at the end of our engagement process was a, a pretty significant additional setback, which is highlighted here. Um, between 15 and 20 feet of additional space was pulled basically to run where, oh, let's see, where the um, uh, balconies are sitting on top of the entrance of the parking garage. That all used to be building. So we pulled that back to have the sight lines from St. Albans feel more um, historically consistent and not create an obstruction right on the edge of the alley. So we took that space and reallocated it um, to other parts of the building um, to ensure that it was stayed viable. Uh, but we felt like that was probably the most significant thing that we were able to accomplish coming out of the community's feedback. I see a question or a comment from Commissioner Rangel Morales. So uh, could you go back to the items that uh, the changes that were made based on community input that, that PowerPoint or that slide? Are you seeing it now? I, I do have it up on my screen. Maybe it's lagging. Uh, I'm not seeing it. But oh, we see it. OK, well, um, from I, I can't see it, but the, the, the one through six, I, I think, or however many were listed, was there any consideration to the size and scale of this project and perhaps going with a tradition like a T2 or an RM2 project? It seems like a lot of the, the negative comments about the project seem to do with how this just uh, jet, jetsons out of the the area compared to the surrounding properties. Yeah, and, and the summit, that's a great question, Commissioner. Um, the Summit Hill Association asked us formally to weigh in on that question. You know, have you considered a uh, less dense building, uh, a building that is three or four stories instead of five? Um, and we, we looked at this extensively. And in order to accommodate a four-story building, a, a three-story building was, was too far out of the realm of viability to, to even get into. But in order to even accommodate a four-story building, we'd have to drop all of that public space, including all of the retail space that is a part of our program right now. And we felt like that was not a win for Grand Avenue. Uh, it wasn't compliant with the mixed use designation of the 2040 plan and didn't add the value that we felt this block and this specific parcel in the neighborhood uh, needed. There's a series of other sort of degradations that would have come with it, but the, the, the one that's easiest to understand and, and identify with is, you know, what Joel has highlighted here essentially goes away. Um, and we didn't feel like that was an appropriate thing for the site. It, it's restaurants all over the, the metro area struggled through COVID and many unfortunately closed, as, as I'm sure everyone is aware. We felt like this was an exceptional opportunity to take restaurants who had a path not to close and not to move elsewhere, not to move to the suburbs, help them stay, but understand kind of the real needs and the real tenants of what it means to be, you know, a viable business on Grand and allow them to stay. And th this project is what those restaurants have, have been clear in saying they need in order to remain on Grand and remain, you know, hopefully for many years to come and, and add you know, two additional uses alongside them. Thank you. Um, I uh, just to make sure just I know that we have a lot of people here to speak during a public comment, so I know I see Commissioner Joy and if we have one or two other commissioners um, and then we'll move move on. So Commissioner Joy. 
Thank you, Chair Baker. Um, I don't mean to disrupt the flow here, but I'm seeing comments in the chat and it might be beneficial to remind people or maybe people that join the meeting um, after your announcement um, that that they, those would not be part of the public record. Just. Just no, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Commissioner DeJoy. So um, just to let you know that if you are from the public and you are um, typing into, well, I'm asking you as a chair not to type into uh, the chat feature, um, it will not be a part of um, the public record. I am also um, just wanted everyone to know that the reason that I may not be calling on those that have hands up that um, are not commissioners is because um, you have a designated time to speak during the public hearing. And so that is the reason why it is not that I am intentionally just will not call on you. I'm trying to um, we have a designated time to do that. So please, um, if that are possible, do not. Um, uh, we're typing the chat feature if you're from the public um, and you're here to speak in favor or in opposition of the uh, application and um, you will have a designated time to be called upon if you are from the public to speak but it is not right now it is coming up though <laughs> um i see commissioner riley Thanks, Chair Baker. Um, I just have, uh, I think, one last question, which is maybe for staff. Maybe it ends up being rhetorical. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but um, I have a question about um, sort of the T3 zoning numbers, uh, finding number seven, um, and the consistency of the T3 zoning with the 2006 plan. Um, and I'm curious. Uh, perhaps staff can explain the rationale of sort of the conflict between um, a 2006 plan that seeks to sort of reduce heights and a 2040 plan that um, seeks to increase density. Um, not that the two need to be mutually exclusive, but um, I'm, I'm curious about um, how that sort of the rationale there. Um, and I, I don't know if now's the time to say it. I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody, but I'm I'm honestly just trying to get enough information to um, to have a recommendation when we get through this. So that's why I'm asking this question. So thanks. Yeah, Commissioner uh, for Commissioner Riley um, staff, um, would you want to respond to that this time? Or can you respond to that this time? Uh, sure, uh, Chair Baker, Commissioner Riley, I, I can try to to answer this. Um, and so what, what is tough about this is because, um, you know, the city just passed their 2040 comprehensive plan, adopted it. And, um, you know, this is a 2006 plan and um, the, the district councils, um, they're supposed to update their plan every 10 years. And it's supposed to be consistent with the comprehensive plan because they're all part of the comprehensive plan. Um, and so I, so I agree with you that this is, uh, difficult when, when you're pulling out specific policies that might um, contradict them, contradict each other. Um, but there are certain aspects of of their of their plan. Um, you know, talking like policy G1 that talks about continuous neighborhood retail, um, and so just that aspect um, of T3 zoning is consistent with that. Um, but but I I think you're kind of getting at the the, um, the overlay district and, and how that is not necessarily consistent with the comprehensive plan or or other policies. Um, so so I, I agree that it's it's difficult to determine this and um, and that's why Summit Hill is is currently updating their plan because it is um, you know 15 years old and they're going through that process right now. All Thanks. right. Uh, thanks, Commissioner Ron. Is there any other questions or comments from my colleagues to the applicant? All right, we will now move forward and open up the public hearing. And just to say to the applicant, um, you will, um, depending on what happens during this uh, public hearing, you may you may have an opportunity to come back. Um, and provide any comments based on um, what you've heard. 
OK, so I am now going to open up the public hearing um, for this application. I will start with um, entertaining um, if anybody would like to speak in favor of this application. I see a few people coming up. I will start with, I think, Charles. I apologize. No. No. Uh, Charles. I wish to speak in opposition. I, I raised my hand too quickly. Thank Got you. It. All right. Uh, Peter Rhodes, um, are you here to speak in favor of this application? I am. Um, can you please um, state your name and address for the record and you will have two minutes. Sure, thank you. My name is Peter Rhodes and I'm at 1879 Rome Avenue. Um, I also am coming, uh, I serve as president of the Summit Hill Association, so I appreciate you having me. And um, I just thought I would join to help. I, I see you've gotten our letter. And I just wanted to speak to that a little bit. Um, we, uh, as uh, Mr. Parrott said, we've had a really extensive engagement process over the last five months. Um, and uh, we've come to a lot of different uh, uh, as he mentioned, a lot of different mitigation efforts and um, conclusions on um, where we wanted to, where we would like this to go. I think in general, um, it's really clear that our neighborhood wants investment in our district. We want investment on Grand Avenue. Um, we see a lot of investment going at Selby and Highland Park. Um, we want, we want investment and. Um, I think uh, we also want, in particular, this site needs investment. Um, it's uh, it, it, this open parking lot um, that I don't think many people really like. And we also have, uh, we've had, like was mentioned in the alley, um, we've heard many concerns over the, the trucks in the alley back there. So we like that, you know, where those have moved. Um, but ultimately, the important thing was that um, as a board, uh, we wanted to be really clear. And, and, and I just want to iterate, um, we spent hours and hours and hours and hours reading through every single public comment. Um, I know I did in particular, and I would encourage all of you to read these too, because they're very nuanced. It's not as clear and um, as for or against. And so I'd really encourage you to read, read through these. Um, and uh, but where we landed is we like this building. We like where it ended up. We we voted strongly in favor for it as designed. Um, but the big thing that we did not want to see happen was uh, is this being an indication of where we landed on the East Grand overlay as a whole. It is it is in our plan. It's in our you know that is the law, and we are planning to to review that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Well. Rhodes. Yep, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, I'm still moving forward for those that are um, here to speak in favor of this application. I see Denise Aldrich. Um, are you here to speak in favor? Hello. Um, yes, I am here to speak in favor of the project. Could you uh, could you state your name and address uh, for the record and you'll have two minutes? Yes, uh, my name is Denise, D-E-N-I-S-E -E Aldrich, A-L-D-R-I-C-H. I live at 1053 Linwood Avenue. Um, and I do wish to state that the comments I make here today are my own personal comments and do not reflect the opinions of any groups that I may be associated with. Okay. At the beginning of this project, um, I did not necessarily take the developers at their word that a project with underground parking wasn't economically feasible at four stories or less. However, as I look around the city at the projects and mixed use projects that are being developed um, around Allegan Stadium and other parts of the neighborhood or parts of St. Paul, um, and we see that there has been virtually no development on Grand Avenue in the last 15 years. Um, this kind of supports his claim that it's because of the way buildings are built today, less than five stories is not economically feasible. I believe that this project is good for the neighborhood as a whole, but probably not for those who live closest to it. 
an analysis of comments received by the Summit Hill Association by the June 18th deadline shows that comments received from those who live within two blocks of the project are overwhelmingly opposed to it. However, if you look beyond that area, a majority of the neighbors who sent in comments support the project. What comes up in conversations with my neighbors from this neighborhood over and over again over the years is everyone who chose to live in this neighborhood moved here because of the proximity to Grand Avenue. Um, everyone supports development on Grand Avenue. Everyone supports the restaurants and shops that are here. Um, <clears throat> In particular, I think this development is an important addition to our neighborhood and keeping the restaurants that we all love and keeping the property in the hands of a local owner is very valuable to us. Um, and I do recommend that the um, board see my written comments, which I submitted, which includes a graphic map of where written right. comments on the project came from. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Aldridge. Um, I am still moving forward with those that are um, here to speak in favor of this application. I see Ted Lentz, is that correct? Uh, Ted, are you okay. here to speak? Yeah, okay, I just was able to unmute. I didn't okay. try that before. Uh, I am here to speak in opposition. My name, I'm sorry, my name is Ted Lentz, and I am here to speak in opposition to the request. So you may need to speak to ask for someone else. Got it. All right, is there anyone else here to speak in favor of this application? Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? And again, is there anyone else here to speak in favor of this application? I see um, My name is Ellen Brown. Yeah, Ellen Brown, I'm sorry. I might not be able to finish this comment. I'm in the emergency room with my brother. But I will try to state my piece quickly. Please state um, your um, I, address. My name is yeah. My name is Ellen E L L E N Brown, like the color. I live at eight seventy four Fairmont. I uh, would like to speak in favor of the project. I think uh, it has three primary grounds that I find very uh, favorable. The first is that seventy five or more new dwelling units will contribute to the commercial vitality of Grand Avenue, which is desperately needed. The housing units that, that are going to be built will be attractive to empty nesters wanting to downsize from their large Summit Hill homes but stay in the neighborhood. And that will free up those large houses for new families, which will continue to make the area vital. And it will also provide a significant contribution to the St. Paul tax base, which I hope we would all be very supportive of. I think it's also very significant that the owner is local and a well-respected business owner. And so I urge the Planning Commission to approve the plan as submitted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. All right, um, is there anyone else here to speak in favor of this application? Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? And last time, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? All right, moving forward, is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? Um, if you populate, I will just start to call. I see uh, Mr. Lentz. <laughs> thank you. And and thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman and the commissioners. I'm speaking to- And please state your um, address oh, for the record. Excellent, yes, I'm Ted. Lentz and address is 692 Summit Avenue. My family has lived in, had that, owned that home since 1973. So um, I feel that 695 Grand Avenue does not qualify for the T3 zoning district and recommend that the zoning commission reject the conclusions that would approve it. The fact that Creating that as a T3 district is, I believe, a triple zoning jump. Uh, going from T3, T2, which it is currently is, to B3, and then up to T3 is pretty remarkable. T3, T3 throughout the city of St. Paul is primarily occurs uh, 
only in existing neighborhoods. It exists at the intersection of two major transit lines. Uh, examples such as the Green Line with 39 passengers a day or the A Line uh, bus route. Uh, there are, uh, uh, to create uh, 695 as a Grand Avenue, as a T3 zone, seems to be an incredible overreach. It is the other parts, the other thing that's true in the city, if the current zoning maps published by the city are correct, is that with virtually no exclusions, exceptions, every T3 district abuts is uh, adjacent to either a T4 or is, a, is surrounded by a T2 district where it abuts a residential district. So to create a small one, less than an acre district is a bit of a jump it's a as it would be a t3 site not a not a district it would be by far the smallest of the uh t3 districts in the in the city i when i talk of t3 appropriate there is i think it's very ex interesting to note the one t3 on grand avenue is at the intersection of grand and snelling that intersection has five lanes east and west on Grand at the at the intersection. It Thanks, has five Mr. lanes north and south. Is that enough? Or should I quit? Yeah, uh, that's thank that's you. Time. All thank right, you. so that's my point. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, I see uh, Linda McKinnon. I may be pronouncing it wrong. Yes, it's Linda McKinnon. Mackinnon, um, please Mackinen, state your M A K I N E N. And your address? Um, I live uh, at 24 St. Albans Street South. Uh, Summit Hill is one of the mo four most dense neighborhoods in St. Paul at 8,541 people per square mile. The current density of the Grand St. Albans four block area is 14,017 people per square mile. Adding an estimated 120 people to the area would bring the density to 16,517 people per square mile. Um, adding this level of density to the block is not supported by St. Paul's 2040 comprehensive plan. Policy LU1 asks for density to be built at existing transit corridors. Grant and St. Albans does not have existing or plan transit that will support a T3 level of plan. Policy LU30 asks for increased density to be built at neighborhood nodes. Grand and St. Albans is not a neighborhood node. Policy LU34 asks for middle density planning comparable, compatible with the scale of urban neighborhoods. The level of increased density in this massive project does not attempt to be compatible with its surrounding neighborhood. The developer calls the difference between three and five stories marginal, but this massive T3 zone project adds too much density to this block at the cost of the valued character of the neighborhood, and it creates increased hazardous traffic and parking for the already burdened surrounding streets. A project designed within the East Grand Overlay District Plan could contribute to the unique character of, character of Summit Hill and would provide added density at a scale the corner and the neighborhood could tolerate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. All right, um, I see um, Shannon O'Toole. Yes, thank you. Shannon <laughs> O'Toole, 223 Avon Street South. Thank the you. last time the city of St. Paul studied parking in our neighborhood, it recognized the area around Grand and St. Albans as having a significant parking shortfall. That was 1993. Nothing has changed. In May 2020, when there was no commercial traffic or parking because COVID had shut down the city, a new survey found that the existing residential cars created a significant parking shortfall once again in the Grand St. Albans area. I've attached data from both surveys with my written comments. The 695 project provides 69 
paid parking spaces for 80 residential units. Many of those units will house more than one person, and most of those people will have cars. At $175 a month for a parking space, how many of the well over 100 residents of the building will actually rent a space? The idea that people will not have cars and will rely on the bus or ride their bikes is not realistic. Few, if any people, work near this neighborhood and getting to work by mass transit is not feasible, feasible for most. The cars owned by the residents of this proposed 80 unit building will overwhelm an already challenged parking area. On top of this, there'll be four retail establishments, including, we are told, at least two restaurants. Right now, there are 60 parking spaces for three restaurants. This project proposes 31 parking spaces for the staff and patrons of all four retail spaces. Where will they all park? All over the neighborhood that was significantly parking challenged even before the project? People don't come to Grand Avenue to shop because of the perceived parking problems. This pro project will make that perception a terrible reality. Parking is just one reason why this project is too big and not the right project for Grand Avenue. Please vote against this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Charles. Thank you. We're going to speak a little bit earlier. I'm here to speak in opposition. Could you state your name and address for the record? Yes, my name is Charles Scrape. I'm a former president of the Summit Hill Association. I'm a former chair of the Heritage Preservation Commission. I've lived at 773 Goodrich Avenue for 30 years. I do not have a direct interest in this project. I oppose the rezoning until a thorough independent traffic study has been conducted. In support of my position, I have submitted a written statement. I will read my two minutes worth of remarks. The developer's traffic study fails to consider the very factors that have made this project controversial. High density housing, intense commercial use, and narrow, already congested streets. Each of these issues is normally considered in a traffic study. Comparative studies can be readily found online. I've documented in my statement current traffic problems on Grand and St. Albans. For example, semi delivery trucks frequently and illegally use the turn lane as a parking lane. Other delivery vehicles indiscriminately double park. Cars are compelled to weave around scoff lawns. Time constraints permit me to give only illustrative examples of future problems, almost none of which I repeat is addressed in the developer's study. Another the residents of 80 units as pedestrians are said by the developer to be key to the future of Grand Avenue. Yet, unlike the usual traffic study, there's no consideration given to pedestrian movement. How many pedestrians will cross Grand Avenue? Where? How long will it take them to cross? How will ve vehicular traffic be affected? Another example, all restaurant patron vehicles will exit onto St. Albans, a single lane, one-way street. All traffic from 80 households will enter and exit on St. Albans. All delivery vehicles for 80 households will enter St. Albans from Summit and exit on Grand. We know from our experience the number of times a day we see vehicles on our own blocks, whether it's Amazon or FedEx, Domino's or DoorDash. Uh, the image I invite you to consider is of cars and vehicles, uh, delivery vehicles backed up to Summit on St. Albans, and indeed on Summit, cars waiting on Summit, coming from both east and west, waiting to cross onto St. Albans. Thank uh, you. Again, I ask that you post, lay over this decision until the information regarding the traffic uh, is, uh, is considered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Marilyn Bopp. Please state your name and address for the record. And I think you're on mute. Yes, my name is Marilyn Bach and I live at 9 St. Albans Street South. I'm in opposition. The developers have asserted that this massive, massive project fits into the area because into this neighborhood because there is a single tall building 
at 745 grand. Therefore, their project fits. I assert this is a totally false uh, position. First of all, 745 grand, which is called Grant Place, was built in 1981 prior to the East Grand Overlay. Now the East Grand Overlay holds. Further, Grand Place is built 30 feet back from the sidewalk. 695 will be three feet from the, from the sidewalk. The alley, which is critical for Grand Place, we have 26 feet from the alley. At 695, the building we will be a mere eight feet from the alley, where in the winter, delivery trucks will get stuck on the ice. And the other thing, the developers seem to have overlooked, perhaps even purposely, that 745 Grand, Grand Place is a strictly a residential place. It has 40 units compared to 695 will have 80. These 40 units simply don't create much traffic. This is a huge difference. 695, in contrast, will have 80 units, four retail places, and we understand at least two of them will be restaurants. That will create enormous congestion and traffic. This will endanger pedestrians, cyclists, automobiles. This building is a massive, massive intrusion. It will overwhelm the area. It will rise over five stories high and will take up 40, 84% of the lot. I am Thank urging you to turn down this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see uh, Sonia Mason, who is also here to speak in opposition of this application. Am I unmuted? You are. Uh, hi there, my name is Sonia Mason. I'm a resident. I live on St. Albans Street South in multifamily housing, and I'm even raising kids in what we call missing middle. If I don't run out of time, I'm gonna read you a quote from that at the end. Could you please state um, your address for the record? Sonia Mason, 21 St. Albans Street, Unit 1. Thank you. Um, so the staff report emphasizes the suitability of this site for mixed use development. Neighbors agree, why are we even here? Um, in fact, right now, the uh, current zoning allows mixed use. Why are we even applying for a rezoning? The land use is permitted under B2. Um, the reason why we're here is because this application is solely to increase the intensity and the scale from what is currently allowed. And they're increasing it, not a little, but far and above um, over what's around it. What is around it is an excellent example of missing middle, walkable neighborhood scale density, multifamily. B2 and T2 are both supported by the Summit Hill plan, as is East Grand. I wanted to make a couple of corrections to the, uh, with respect, um, to the staff report. Finding three was an error. Um, the neighboring properties that are zoned RM2 cannot have a 50 foot height limit because they are within the East Grand Avenue overlay. The East Grand Avenue has a 40 foot height limit for residential structures and the majority of the surrounding structures meet that height limit. Uh, finding four error is saying that this height would match and it's based on that 65 foot building which is a block away, which is an anomaly. It's a non-conforming structure, and you should not base a finding on a non-conforming structure. It's also a structure that, in part, caused the East Grand Overly to be written. Um, and then findings uh, seven, um, it's not in compliance with the Summit Hill plan. Uh, G5 specifically states that B2 and BC zoning are the most appropriate for Grand Avenue. It's currently zoned B2, which allows mixed use. G6 states rezoning and variances are opposed by the Summit Hill Association in those areas where parking and traffic problems persist. 
H7 ensure that the impact of any increased density conforms to zoning and building requirements. H9 uh, mixed use buildings should respect the historic nature and character of the neighborhood. Thank With you, Ms. Mason. comp plan policies LU29, LU34, LU35, LU36, and LU47 all talk about scale and sensitivity and compatibility with Thank the you, Ms. buildings. Thank you. Um, we're moving on to Rosalind, who's here to speak in opposition of this application. Yes, my name is Rosalind Goldberg. I live at 1023 Grand Avenue, number six, and I've been there for 40 years. Um, I did submit some written comments, so I, I will not say all of my objections right now, but you can read my full comments mm -hmm. that were in writing. I am adamantly opposed to the rezoning request regarding 695 Grand Avenue. This is a no brainer. There are too many exceptions needed for this project too many exceptions, even with a rezone. That says it all, it is too big, period. The developers knew from the beginning it was non-compliant and submitted it anyway. By their own admission, they have and had no intention of complying. They ignored the number one issue that is bothering people, which is the height issue. They ignored it repeatedly. Um, they had ample opportunities to fix this problem so that they would not have to rezone. 77% of the neighborhood is opposed to this. We cannot approve spot zoning. There are rules for a reason, and um, it actually defeats the purpose of the overlay plan. Um, there are other projects on the horizon, as you know, and they will also want their own personal private zoning. This is a can of worms. This project is too big. It does not fit in this historic neighborhood. We are not Snelling in University. Um, there are too many exceptions uh, to make it work. Please do not approve this. I think that this project belongs um, in downtown St. Paul, which does need development. And like I say, please read my full comments because I only touched on one thing. And that is all the exceptions and the fact that it's too big. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am, uh, thank you, Rosalind. Moving on to Hillary Parson. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can. Hi, Please Hillary Parson. Oh, 42, 42 St. Albans. So I'm right across from this project. And I echo all the sentiments before about opposing it. I am concerned about public safety. I live at the corner of the one way of St. Albans onto Grand and um, seeing people struck as they've crossed Grand because cars coming off Dale are just zooming down. This project is just going to worsen the amount of traffic trying to get from St. Albans onto Grand, and that's already a difficult corner taking a right or left. Furthermore, St. Albans is pretty busy already as people use it to skip Dale to get to 35 South. Okay, it's already a very trafficy street without the backup of people who live in 80 units. Um, parking is also a major issue. Not only are they reducing the number of spots, you know, they're adding way too many people in an already really, really dense neighborhood. This little block area is the densest in Summit Hill, which is a pretty dense um, residential neighborhood. This idea that these 80 units are somehow going to save brand when the traffic around there is going to be so problematic that people from out of the area are going to avoid it like the plague. It's a problem and it's a problem that the developers, they're so looking at the financial um, benefits to having these high luxury and rental units that they're just putting all of this under the rug. And so I am appealing to you as the higher ups to see some reason, you know way more about zoning than I do. And I think you can see how extremely inappropriate this particular building is for this part of the neighborhood or any part of something. Oh, really? It does not fit into the current character of the neighborhood by adding two additional stories 
without any decrease as it goes into the residential area. It's just going to be a massive wall along St. Albans. It's unattractive and unappealing, and it's a massive mistake for this area and the city, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Parson. Uh, I am moving on to, I think it says Susan St. John. And I think you may be on mute. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, I think. Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Susan St. John. I live in 25 South Bankston Street. Um, my block is 100% multifamily. The most dense area of the Hill residents. We support multifamily housing and we want new housing, especially affordable housing. But I'm here today to present the petition that our volunteer group has developed as proposed 695 Avenue 60 project. That petition presented was created and selected by volunteers over a short period of time after the application of 695 Grand Sixties development was filed. The petition reads, a better way for Grand Avenue in St. Paul. We oppose 695 Grand Dixie Project proposal, which violates all existing zoning codes. We oppose the the proposed rezoning, conditional use permit, and all modifications and exceptions <coughs> excuse me, to current zoning. We support a better way for those who live, visit, shop, eat, walk, and bike on Grand Avenue. <coughs> we support a better project that meets current zoning regulations with no variances or zoning exception. She has 419 signatures as of 629-21. The signatures of the protest are for 194 residents. This includes renters, Thank you. and homeowners in condos and houses. One hundred and one shoppers and visitors. Uh, your time is up. Sixty-three business owners and employees. Uh, I'll say it one more time. Your time is up, or you will be muted. Thank you. All right, we are moving on to Jason, who is here to speak in opposition. Uh, hello, can I be heard? Yes, uh, uh, please state your name and address. Yeah, uh, my name is Jason Betchkel. I live at 825 Goodrich Avenue. Um, and I'm just here to speak in opposition of the, the, the development, not development in general. I just do not believe that this is the right development or the right size of development for the piece of property. Um, as you can see by my address, I do not have, I don't live right next to it, but I still want to see a vibrant community on Grand Avenue. And as I look over the 2040 comp plan that is helped to create as a roadmap for us in city planning, I see some inconsistencies. I know earlier there are some consistencies, but there seems to be some inconsistencies line with uh, starting with LU 29, which is ensuring the building mass, height, scale and design transition to those permitted to adjoining districts, which outside of 745 grand, the six story building that was mentioned earlier in our conversation, really there isn't too much. And this building has very little setback and quite high compared to the buildings that are just adjacent to it. 
casting shadows as well as as just being a a, a major impact from a line of sight. Going on to LU36, once again, the common theme in these policies come back to scale and existence as it relates to the existing residential development that it's going into. So, and then H47, once again, um, the development has to be sensitive to the context of the neighborhood. And this doesn't seem like it is. It seems like this is an outlier and inconsistent with our very plan that was put into to uh, put into action back in November of 2020. So I guess my concerns are, is this, can we can we have development and have, um, have, have it look presentable and be presentable to the community and the neighborhood? And I feel like this particular rendering or this direction that has been proposed um, for 695 does not necessarily meet that. Thank you, Chair Baker. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jason. Moving on to um, Brenda Besser. Um, please state, uh, if you're here to speak in opposition, please state your name and address for the record. To speak in opposition. Um, I live at 24 St. Albans Street South, Unit 2. My name is Brenda Besser. I oppose the 695 Grand Avenue project and its move to T3 zoning. The proposed building is too big for the limitations of the roads that will serve it. T3 is dependent on a strong high, frequent, high frequency transit infrastructure, which Grand Avenue will never be able to, pro to provide at the level appropriate for T3 zoning. Grand Avenue has one local bus route, the number 63. The route recently reduced its number of stops. Uh, there is no stop at the corner of St. Albans and Grand at this point. There used to be. Pre-COVID ridership statistics reported by the Metropolitan Council showed an 8% reduction in ridership for local lines from 2018 to 2019, and this includes the 63. Ridership was healthier um, for the express services and bus rapid transit, such as the A-Line and light rail. Um, the Met Council report also states that ridership grows in corridors with frequent fast service. The implication here um, is that the future for real expansion of transit ridership is in increasing all forms of express service, which again, Grand will never be able to support due to its being a two lane road and the nature of mixed traffic, which includes private cars, delivery vans, trucks, buses, bicycles, and most importantly, for this neighborhood, a high number of pedestrians. Speed and efficiency are not and will never be the hallmarks of transit service on Grand Avenue. While the 63 bus is sufficient for short excursions along or near the avenue, it cannot provide the more demanding transit needs of large 80 unit buildings. For this reason, it will not attract a significant number of transit, de transit dependent residents. They will always have cars because they will never view the 63 line as meeting their high frequency transit needs. Therefore, a building the size of the 695 project is appropriate to existing T3 nodes like University and Stelling, but not the proposed location. Please do not approve the you You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I also see Pamela Benson. I'm here to speak in opposition. Um, if so, please state your name and address for the record. My name is Pamela Benson. I live at 682 Summit Avenue. I am opposed to this rezoning application. And as stated earlier, this is a no brainer and would be a massive mistake for the city and for the neighborhood. I'm a longtime visitor and a 10 year resident of this neighborhood, first as a renter and now as a homeowner in Summit Hill. This proposal mentions a nod to the neighborhood and I just don't see it. It's not consistent with the way this area has developed and the 480 letters Summit Hill Association received in opposition on the project and 47 letters in support indicate that the neighborhood isn't supportive of this project as it's proposed. It's too generic and too large and it does not honor or protect the uniqueness of this neighborhood. In response to the increasing density, any number of residences on that site would increase density above what it currently is for that parcel. 
The community does not want this building to, as Ari Parrott stated, serve as a model to what this area will be in the future. The efforts by the developer to respond to the concerns repeatedly raised in months of community engagement were cosmetic at best. I'm opposed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Benson. I see Margaret Gradient. Um, please state your name and address for the record. My name, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Margaret Gadiant. I'm a past board member of the Summit Hill Association, and I live at 809 Lincoln Avenue. Many of the concerns have already been addressed, such as parking and, and traffic in the area. But I want to say that this proposal fails to transition to the density in this area. The policy states that quote, transitions in density or intensity shall be managed through careful attention to building height, scale, massing, and solar exposure, end quote. The proposed development is surrounded by residential units, but this, the large mass and tallness and longest walls on west, north, and east sides of the development all bordering on residential units. The solar orientation casts maximum shadows on these properties. The setbacks are not compliant. The St. Albans side is not consistent with the code, which states that the setback must be the average of those on the block. The proposed structure has a setback of three feet, while 15 feet is required. Compliance for this property is not impractical or unreasonable. The change to T3 zoning on this lot is detrimental to the neighbors and the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. I am now, uh, I see Eric Ruland. Um, if you're here to speak in opposition, uh, please state your name and address for the record. Thank you, Cedric. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Dr. Eric Ruland. I live at 790 Summit Avenue. I own the business. Uh, I own St. Paul Pet Hospitals uh, at 377 Dayton Avenue and 2057 Randolph Avenue in Highland Park. I'm speaking in opposition of the proposed changes to the zoning. Um, I have a couple. I have a few points and I just want I already submitted a um, I already submitted a written comment but I would like to just hit on three major topics. Um, if the builders and developers would have gone back to the neighborhood and asked everybody what the size and the scope, actually, I'll just back up a little bit. I, I bought my home at 790 Summit Avenue specifically to refurbish and to re-historically uh, um, build and rebuild a home. It was vacant and I, opposed, or I, I followed every rule with HPC. When I had to put a wooden door in the back of my house and HPC said I had to have a wooden door. I didn't go back to them and say, that's not financially feasible. When I had to put a wooden door at my at my business at 377 Dayton, I didn't put, I didn't, I didn't go back to them and say, I, I can't do this because it's not financially viable. I think the builder's argument that they can't build a three story building and stick within the zoning code is completely erroneous and it doesn't make any sense to anyone in the neighborhood and if they would have taken a few minutes to ask people in the neighborhood and i walk that block every single day i'm there i walk my dogs every day i walk my son up there every day everybody says the size and the scope of this project is a problem and when the builders come back to us and say we can't do it because it's not viable that doesn't fit with us the other issue is the fact that the staff report lacks any notion about the historic nature of the of the neighborhood and why we all live here says a lot about this. I think nobody would say that we don't want development or we don't want to have an, this intimate nature of the, of the residential and the, and the commercial businesses. The last thing I wanna say is, the reason that businesses are fleeing Grand Avenue is, is because the commercial prices are so high. And if people think that people are gonna go into a new building on Grand Avenue and pay premium prices, it's just not going to happen. There's another issue at stake. So thank you very much. I am in staunch opposition of this rezoning. Thank you. Um, 
I do see um, Annie Holland. That's correct. Can you hear me? That is, uh, yes, we can. Um, can you state your name and address for the record? My name is Annie Holland. I am at 720 Summit Avenue and I am opposed. So uh, I think there is a way forward with reasonable development that conforms with the 2040 comp plan. There are some relevant sections from the comp plan that I would like to read that show how important the scale and sensitivity to the neighborhood is. So policy LU1 to encourage transit supportive density and direct the majority of growth to areas with the highest existing or planned transit capacity. Policy LU29, ensure that building massing, height, scale, and design transition to those permitted in adjoining districts. Policy LU34, provide for medium density housing that diversifies housing options, such as townhouses, courtyard apartments, and smaller multifamily developments compatible with the general scale of urban neighborhoods. Policy LU35, provide for multifamily housing along arterial, and collector streets and in employment centers to facilitate walking and leverage the public transportation. Policy LU36 promote neighborhoods serving commercial businesses with urban neighborhoods that are compatible again with the character and scale of the existing residential development. Policy H47 encourage high quality urban design for residential development that is sensitive to context but allows for innovation and consideration of market needs. And then I would like to read a quote from the missing middle, which is also um, um, identified in the comp plan. Um, the missing middle quote is, many cities over the past couple decades have introduced drastic policies and zoning to allow higher density development. The result has often been offered five plus story buildings abutting single family homes, which usually result in an outcry from adjacent neighborhoods. Applying missing middle housing is a great way to transition from these corridors into lower scale neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Jonathan Mason, are you here to speak in opposition of this application? I am. Um, would you state your name and address the record? Uh, Jonathan Mason, 21 St. Albans. And I am speaking um, today. I, I, for one, was the one who um, developed the video and site plan and alternative design that you may have seen. But right now, I would like to point out that um, the plan, some of the planning documents have uh, inaccurate information, and that may have uh, affected the staff report, uh, specifically. Um, the, the buildings yeah, in oh, yeah. here, this, this 707, it was stated to be 38 feet tall, and it is not 38 feet tall, it is 25 feet tall. You can see that. And the sure. building directly behind this is um two and a half yeah, stories so tall not three stories tall three and a half stories tall the these types of omissions and inaccuracies would greatly affect the um the staff report and those kinds of omissions were brought to the attention of the developer and consequently they were not changed in fact the height on the 707 was made a foot taller from 37, 38 feet after our bringing up of these errors. I recommend that um, the staff report gets re-looked at with these omissions corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I see uh, Howard Quinlan here to speak in opposition. If so, please state your name and address for the record. Sure, thank you. I'm Howard Quinlan and I owned a house at 223 South Avon Street for 27 years. And prior to that, I've rented and owned rental property in the adjacent uh, and on Grand Avenue. And you know, as such, I, I, I have a fair understanding of the complexities and the challenges of Grand Avenue developments and all the issues that you, that you face. Um, 
and and I, I, I want to echo that everyone is in favor of vital sharing of development between residential and business, et cetera, et cetera. But this particular proposed um, uh, proposal presents a serious range of complex variance requests that really, I, I just ask you to think about, they completely disregard previously established guidelines, standards, and plans. Specifically, and I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but think of this. This is what you were being asked to change. The proposed use is not in substantial compliance with the 2040 plan. The proposed use is not in substantial compliance with the East Grand Avenue overlay, which is the result of a small area plan. The proposed use is not in substantial compliance with the Summit Hill Neighborhood Comprehensive Plan, which caused, which called for the East Grand Avenue overlay and called for B2, T2 top zoning. However, it's clear, I, I, you got to take into consideration, the proposal will do some things. One, it'll be detrimental to the existing character of the development in the immediate neighborhood. I'm surprised that the St. Albans people are so reserved. I mean, they, their property values have just diminished. The, propose, the proposal will affect the historic nature of the area. I, I think that the fact that it has been disregarded in this, in this conversation is, is germane. And the proposal, most importantly, will prevent um, reasonable enjoyment of the adjacent properties. I just ask, in light of this, let's be reasonable. Let's look for a balanced approach to to development that respects the desires of the neighborhood, the history of the neighborhood, and the many years of hard work in developing the neighborhood. I mean, you saw in the in the surveys, we're all for fair development, but I mean, I can't believe we're really looking at this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quinlan. Um, is there anyone else here to speak in opposition of this application? Is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? And is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? Here, uh, Shandon Holland? Yeah, hi, yep, can you hear me okay? I can, um, please state your name and address for the record. Great, yeah, I'm Shandon Holland. I live at 720 Summit Avenue. I'd like to speak in opposition to this, I think. Most of the other people have spoken well about the technical reasons, and I think those are probably the most important. But I'd also like to just point about, make a point about the more common sense issues here, which is I grew up on a farm where, where people would get together and talk about things when they were going to build something new or something that might be unneighborly. And it feels like, um, and that would be respected. They would build barns or, or big uh, where, where you'd have a, a lot of animals not close to other people's homes. Now, I know I don't mean to say this is a, an analogy, but just a metaphor about um, people would get together and work on this. And I feel like that, although there were neighborhood meetings, there hasn't been much adjustment and change to accommodate the requests of people who do want good development and, and want um, uh, something great to go up there. And I think there's a lot of good potential, but I don't think this is it. And I'd like the, the folks to put this back, um, to not approve this, and, but would like to see something move forward. Lastly, since I got a little bit of time, is I, uh, I work with a lot of people who are very low income. And I think, you know, the big uh, pressing need in, in St. Paul is around uh, having more affordable housing. And this kind of does the exact opposite. It continues to concentrate opportunity and wealth in, in one area and uh, doesn't, doesn't have any affordable housing units in it. So that's uh, an important consideration, too. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, is there anyone here else? Is there anyone else here to speak in opposition of this application? Is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? Now, last time, is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? All right, hearing none, I will call back the applicant um, if you would want to make any comments. So I just want to say that you heard a lot. Um, you may want to focus on those things that you feel like are more pressing and that you would like to respond to. And this will also be an opportunity for my colleagues to uh, make any comments or ask you any questions. So um, please speak if you would like to add anything. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll just start with a broad response to the series of comments made about um, the fact that our project does not comply with existing zoning and specifically the East Grand Overlay. Um, I hope I hope 
commissioners take this uh, what I'm about to say seriously that that was not a mystery to us it, it's not we're not sitting here today being like oh we're not compliant with the overlay that was the fundamental feature of the engagement process that we went through we looked at what we felt this project uh, needed we looked at what the existing regulations were we realized that there was an incompatibility there and we said okay well how do we go about exploring if those two things can be bridged Right, you, you have rezoning processes for a reason. Zoning codes all over the metro area, all over the country, wherever they may be, you know, exist as guidance. And when there are exceptions and reasonably good information to petition for a rezone, you then have a process to petition for a rezone. So that was our line of thinking. And we then we had that ultimately substantiated by the official representation of the neighborhood of the Summit Hill Association. And so we feel like, you know, the references to we didn't listen or we're not compliant, therefore this project is inappropriate. While I understand the intention behind them, absolutely, and I understand the emotion behind them, and I understand the real life experience behind them. And, and meanwhile, that experience being one that we as the development team also share. We also live in this neighborhood. We also work in this neighborhood. This is not foreign territory to us. We understand these things intimately. We put all those together and still felt like where the precedent exists, especially on this section of Grand Avenue for higher density housing and higher height and where the circumstances we feel like justify the uh, rezoning from B2 to T3 to enable a new project like this to exist. We felt like there was enough uh, uh, enough there to go through this process with the SHA and then certainly uh, humbled and grateful that we were able to earn the SHA support. Believe me, that was not something that was given freely. Uh, we worked hard for it and um, we're really proud of the result. Um, so I'll start with that. There's just a few specific comments that I want to make. W one of the commenters made a reference to us not having done a traffic study. We have indeed done a traffic study, multiple versions of a traffic study. And that traffic study was not independent of the project. It didn't just look at what is currently at 695 grand. It looked at what our project is, what our units are, what our mix is, what the uh, amount and variety of retail spaces are, parking that we have planned, access points that we have planned. It was all integral to our project. And that parking study determined that the number of parking spaces that we have and the access points that we have are indeed appropriate. And all of that, if it wasn't independent enough, then went through, as, as I'm sure you chair and, and commissioners know, went through public works to substantiate that. And we reached consensus that this was an appropriate um, uh, traffic and parking solution for our project and that it did not create uh, any negative consequences for pedestrian, bike, or vehicle safety on any of the adjacencies of this project. And certainly if Public Works had asked us to do a, a different traffic study or uh, include something else, we gladly would have. Um, it, it's our intention too to make sure that there are no safety or pinch point or other um, negative externalities that, that we may create. Um, you know, the, the other point that I, I just want to talk about that one of the commenters made about people fleeing Grand Avenue because the prices are too high, we view our project as having a role in helping to alleviate some of that pressure. Part of the reason why prices are high is because the tax base isn't high enough to spread um, the burden around and that manifests itself in higher property taxes for the neighborhood and certainly higher property taxes for Grand Avenue businesses. And we look at our project and the incremental tax revenue that it will generate over what's there today as a really, really, really important tool that the city has and the neighborhood to a certain extent has and the county obviously to help alleviate some of that pressure and enable our businesses and all of the adjacent businesses on Grand to continue to survive. You have to enable new development to grow the tax base to then lower the burden for everybody that make up the tax base. So I, I wanted to make sure that um, that our, our position on that was clear as well. Um, and you know, the last thing that I'll mention is there was a few different references to the sole precedent um, that we've focused on or that we're citing being the uh, six story condo building grand place uh, about a block to our west. Um, while that is certainly a part of the portfolio of precedents, it's absolutely not the only one. Um, we looked at that building and we looked at dozens of other buildings that are make up the intersection of Grand and St. Albans and then, you know, further east and further west and said, does this project fit in? How does it relate to all of the different elevations that exist up and down Grand Avenue? 
and up and down St. Albans. And we reached the conclusion that it, do, it does fit. And we'll talk about this more in a couple weeks, but the Summit Hill Association agreed too. We, we got uh, majority support for uh, our CUP, which was pegged to a certain height. So we know that the neighborhood support is there. We, we were not on an island uh, in our thinking about the height of our building being unique. Um, we think it fits in well and will contribute to the continued vitality of brand. So um, I uh, so at this point, I'm not planning to move forward and um, call back um, those that are in favor of acquisition. Um, I will open it up to my colleagues. I see um, Commissioner Ringo Morales, but before he says anything, I did want to just say that one of the things that there was kind of a consistent theme, and since it came up during public comment, I wanted to get your perspective on it as the applicant, um, but around uh, just the size of the building and, and your rationale, at least earlier in the presentation, was about it being viable. And um, many people are having concerns in the community around how tall it is that they are saying, at least, that they are not against development. They are specifically concerned about the size of this development. So how do you respond to those community members that um, said that, yes, you engaged them, but yet you did not make a change um, to that specific area or scope of the project? Yeah, thanks for that question, Mr. Chairman. Um, we we did address that question extensively with the neighborhood and everyone who asked us individually, which were dozens of people over the past five months. Um, and our answer has been consistent that in order to accommodate a four story building, you'd have to eliminate all of the ground floor publicly accessible space. And we didn't feel like that was the right project. Uh, really for anybody, but certainly not for the neighborhood. I can understand why certain people who live adjacent to the site might appreciate a four story building over a five story building, but the marginal loss in what that building is offering to its broader surroundings, we felt like was inappropriate and not justified. So we put forward the project that we felt like checked every one of the boxes, not just height. And while people said to us, we think it's too tall, can you lower it? They also said to us, how about these eight other things? Wh whatever the number is, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm using that rhetorically. And we said, okay, well, we've studied the height. That's one thing that we can't do anything about, but you know what? We can do something about all of these eight other things. Let us change this and let us modify that. And let us pull this back and let us add some more definition over here and there. Um, so we, we tried, we, and, th and those comments came from people who live 10 feet from the project and people who live 100 feet and people who live, you know, in, all, in other corners of the neighborhood. And we tried to triangulate those all together. And we, to a certain extent, relied on what we then heard from the Summit Hill Association to say, OK, are we doing this? Like, are we succeeding in this? And we felt like at the end of that engagement process, with the voting that occurred, we felt like we succeeded. We felt like that was a uh, Yes, we, we did this, even though we didn't make everybody happy. And even though we couldn't do something about the height, we did a lot of other things and we felt like there was real power in that. All right, I see uh, uh, Commissioner Rangel Morales and then Commissioner Riley. So uh, Mr. Parrott, uh, thank you for your comments. And um, I'll, I'll just preface that. I, I think you, uh, you when you were talking about um, sort of uh, what the advantages of growing the tax base in St. Paul, I think that that starts addressing issues that will, will probably be addressed with the CUP, and I hope that staff has sort of prefaced the importance of um, affordable housing to this to this committee, and so we can have those discussions at a later time. But with regards to your point about that the scale is appropriate for this site, and 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 I, what what uh, I noted from your comments is you felt that it was appropriate. And I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to visualize Grand Avenue in which there is a building of this scale, five stories commercial and this big. And I, I'm, I'm having trouble uh, seeing where in Grand Avenue this type of building exists. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a five story building or a four story building. It could be, for example, like the buildings that are on Victoria and Grand that are two or three stories that are mixed use commercial and, and resident uh, residential. So could you just speak to that as to what what are your what 
what you're comparing it to when you say you feel it does meet the 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 building sizes that are currently there. Yeah, just, sure. Thanks for the question, Commissioner Rangel Morales. Um, Joel, can you pull up our presentation again? I, I want to illustrate this um, visually versus just with my voice. Thanks. If you can zoom into that a little bit. So, Commissioner, hopefully this image will better illustrate what we mean by fit in. So you can look at the elevations of the buildings, which is taken from Google Earth, which is very accurate. Would I say that it's 100.0 accurate? No, but it, it's about as accurate as we can get with this kind of study. This is not illustrative. It, it's to scale. And you can see the positioning of our building relative to the buildings immediately to the east and then immediately to the west, three buildings over, then you go up again. To the south, you have two buildings that are of similar massing. And to the north, you have buildings that are similar of their time. So actually, the, the building on the corner of St. Albans and the alley where there's a 41 foot designation there, you can see it's a similar U-shaped building. It doesn't have the same kind of underground parking infrastructure and elevator infrastructure and fire life safety infrastructure, et cetera, that our building needs to have today. So all of that stuff takes up additional space and manifests in a larger building than what was built 100 years ago. So we, we looked at the elevations, we looked at the shapes, we looked at the rhythm. So one of the things that you'll notice about our project is that it's not one big block, although we did look at big blocks, you know, sort of more of a donut shape that has a like a light well right through the middle that could have been lower and more stout and more function more like a wall along Grand. But we felt like this rhythm of having you know, legs that look and feel really similar to the other buildings of that size all up and down Grand with then a significant setback in between them where you have outdoor plaza space and a building that rises from levels two to five that is really imperceptible from the pedestrian level as you walk up and down Grand. Thank you, Joel. We felt like that fit in perfectly. And, and I, I careful about now using the word feel because I don't want this to be an emotional thing. I, I mean it to be practical and literal to a certain extent as you look at the positioning of our building relative to all of those other buildings that we just had displayed. Thank you and I appreciate that. Um, great visual and, and, and I mean that addressed my question. I, I think I have a follow up question for staff. Um, I, just, just so you know where I'm at, I, I do think that there is a big difference between the 60 feet and the 42 feet surrounding it. I do see that building the 65 feet. And so then my question is going to be more for staff, but just so you know where my thought is, is what caused the Grand Avenue overlay to occur? My guess is that there were some events that occurred within Grand Avenue that probably caused neighborhood the neighborhood to come together to, to impose that overlay. And so, uh, that's just a question for staff, but thank you so much for that response. Thanks, Commissioner Reagan Morales. Uh, Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Chair Baker. Um, I'll, I mean, I can answer uh, uh, Commissioner Rangel Morales' question kind of succinctly. <laughs> it was designed to um, limit um, uh, Design, design, designs that are common of big box retail. That was initially the reason why that was put on, but I, I'll also defer to staff later. Um, I have a lot of, um, the applicant said something about feelings, and so I, I have a lot of feelings, and I think there's a lot of feelings happening here, um, and, and that's okay. Um, I, uh, I, I personally, I think right now would rather lay this over for more information um, associated with, um, you know, adjacent, literally surrounding the property heritage preservation um, issues. Um, I don't have any issues with things like the park, the, the traffic study, um, but I, I have an awful lot of, of thoughts. Um, and I think I'll start um, with um, sort of where I stand on proposals generally for density in St. Paul, which is that I'm very much in support of increasing density in St. Paul, especially around um, transit um, opportunities, 
Um, I think, you know, as an eat resident on the east side where we have a lot of sort of more typically um, suburban style development that is maybe contributing to this tax base mismatch that um, the applicant has talked about. Um, I'm a strong believer um, in density and the densification around transit um, in, in the city. However, um, I'm also a strong believer that our more wealthy neighborhoods don't get, should not get pre preferential treatment um, around development, even when, or perhaps especially when the developer is someone who lives, um, works, um, and owns property in um, the city. Uh, we've seen negative impacts of that in the long run. Um, and I think that often what happens in um, the wealthier neighborhoods, um, and this neighborhood happens to have the same median income as the city, um, so close to um, the state's median income. Um, what we have here is, um, you know, a proposal that suggests that it's a good thing um, for St. Paul because it is more dense and has more tax base, and I think that generally that's true, um, but I've also um, had the experience myself uh, a struggling with neighborhood opposition to these new to a new large mixed use development um, with a lot of opposition from the neighbors where ultimately uh, the project is constructed um, and you know you you have a neighborhood who sort of comes to um, appreciate the the new residents and the new structure um, also adjacent to a historic district in this case um, but I think that this this situation is a little bit different. And I, I would like to say that in my education, we are taught that there's no such real, there's no real such thing as a precedent in land use planning and land use law um, until it gets to the point of uh, a Supreme Court of a state or um, the nation. And so um, I, uh, I reject, you know, some of the so-called public safety concerns that have been raised by those in opposition. Um, I don't think those are, are really relevant. Um, I think that clearly the B2 zoning is inappropriate um, because Grand Avenue as built um, doesn't even meet the dimensional standards um, that of some of the districts that exist in it. I actually don't think B2 zoning is appropriate in St. Paul at all at this point, given um, how we have developed and the, the length of time that has passed since some of these buildings have been um, built. However, um, a comprehensive plan is a visionary document that sets the goal um, for development in a city um, or a jurisdiction for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and from that, all other official controls must stem from the policy direction in the comprehensive plan. And in this scenario, I don't think that the proposal for a T3 zoning is appropriate. Um, and I have a list of um, findings and and ultimately will make a motion um, if allowed to deny uh, this particular rezoning and I have a list of rationale for Mr. Warner um, but I'll stop there um, and just note that um, you know this is a, a hard conversation to have and I want more density um, and some of the um, issues that are raised here though don't um, necessarily uh, rise to the level of um, consideration, but I want those folks who are talking to us, you know, we've got um, dozens of comments um, from a population of adults that is around 6,000 people. Um, that doesn't represent to me necessarily the neighborhood, and I think we know um, as uh, residents in St. Paul that often the members of our boards, um, our neighborhood boards, don't necessarily represent um, the opinion or the feelings or the belief systems held by the majority of the people, because only a couple of people get to serve on those um, on those boards. Uh, so that's kind of um, that's kind of where I am right now. I have a lot more thoughts, but um, I I'll stop now because I know Christine has uh, Commissioner Grill and, and Commissioner Rangel Morales has comments as well. So thanks, so, uh, thanks, thanks Commissioner Riley. I, I will say that technically the public. Uh, hearing is still open. If we are planning to move forward with discussion, I would ask that you wait um, until we close the public hearing. I am asking that my colleagues specifically ask questions of the applicant at this time. I'm given a window of time of a few minutes to do this. So um, Commissioner Grill, did you would you like to ask or make a comment to the applicant? No. Okay. No, I was 
So hoping that we were getting close to calling. Yeah. Question. I don't know. I'm just going to raise that point. OK, so um, any other questions or comments for the applicant? From my colleagues. All right, uh, thank you so much for um, providing perspectives and uh, responding to what you've heard during public comment. I am officially now closing the public hearing. And now I will entertain a motion and or discussion from my colleagues. Um, I saw Commissioner Grill and also Commissioner Rangel Morales. And I see Commissioner Riley. So um, let's start with Commissioner Rangel Morales. Uh, let's start with Commissioner Grill and then we'll go to Commissioner Rangel Morales. All right, um, I'm fully expecting. Thank you, Chair. I'm fully expecting there's going to be a full discussion here. Um, but uh, Commissioner Greer, you're breaking up. In the interest of time, we're just making sure that uh, everyone has the potential to be published. Pony to community business T3 traditional neighborhood for 695 Grand Avenue um, and denial of the proposed rezoning out of the East Grand Overlay District at 695 Grand Avenue. OK, um, uh, Commissioner Grill, um, just to confirm because you're breaking up for a moment, am I am I hearing that you are making a motion for staff's recommendation for approval um, and denial? It, so staff's recommendation, did I, did I just hear you say that? That's correct, that's correct. All right, we have a motion on the table from Commissioner Grill. Do we have a second? Um, and this is uh, moving forward with staff's recommendation. Second. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hood second that. OK, so we have a motion and a second. I, I will entertain discussion at this time. And I see Commissioner Rangel Morales. So I think Commissioner Riley highlighted uh, a little bit about what this question is. It's, it's, it's a question for staff in terms of Unlike a CUP or a zoning variants where there's a different like a defined standard for either approving or denying, looking at the staff recommendation in this case, it's just sort of a, 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 a enumerated comments as to how they arrived at their resolution. But I'm just want some direction from them as to what what standard are we using for approving uh, a rezoning? Um. Ms. Sigward, did you want to respond to that or staff? Um, yes, thank you, um, Chair Baker, Commissioner Regal Morales. Um, so I, I can speak to you a little bit about what, what I know um, through the rezoning process. And um, this is actually my first rezoning case, so I am not the expert, definitely. And I would um, like my colleagues to step in. Um, but my understanding is that um, there are the the, um, the, the findings and um, we kind of have it broken up. Um, the first few findings are kind of just information and then um, the following findings. So this is starting at finding four um, where we talk about um, consistent with the way that the area has developed. So that's one of the um, one of the things that we are checking. And then the second one is um, consistent with the comprehensive plan. And then, so that starts at finding five, and that's finding uh, through seven, and then, um, sorry, fi through finding eight. So that's talking about the consistency with the comprehensive plan. And then finding nine, um, this is another um, proposed zoning is compatible with the surrounding uses. So that's another part of, um, that goes into our analysis. And then finding 10, um, which talks about spot zoning being illegal. Um, so those are the four. Um, so let's see the spot zoning, compatible with surrounding uses, consistency with the comprehensive plan, and then um, uh, consistent with consistency with the way that the area has developed. So that is those are the four um, the four things that we are looking for in a rezoning. And um, and we have we have to show that those are that those are met in order to um, 
in order to uh, recommend approval for for the rezoning. Chair, if I could ask a follow up question or yes. It, um, Ms. Worth, could you comment also on the overlay district when it was created? What, if if uh, I know perhaps Mr. Riley is pr probably better able to answer that as he might have worked on it, but um, why it was created? Uh, what what were the the drives behind it? Um, yes, so I, I was looking into some um, you know 2006 planning commission meeting, and um, I was hoping for a, a pretty thorough staff report. Um, about about this, and they they basically said that this is what um, what was in the Summit Hill District Plan. So that that was passed previously in um, in February, and then this came to the Planning Commission in June. Um, and so what what I was seeing was um, that the overlay provides room for change and growth, um, but also reinforces and respects the character of Grand Avenue. And so they wanted to ensure that the character of the of the small scale development was um was respected and um, they were hoping that it would provide room for change and growth and it's my understanding that it was also in response to um to some taller buildings that that were constructed um specifically the, Ox the oxford one that was in 2005 that was a, uh, a four-story building and um, i think they were getting pressure um like commissioner riley had said about big box development um so they wanted to protect um, the neighborhood from that as well. All right. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Ring Morales. I see Commissioner Riley and then Commissioner Tagioff. I'd actually like to defer to Commissioner Tagioff if that's okay. That's fine. Uh, Commissioner Tagioff. That's very kind of you, Commissioner Riley. Um, so first up, um, I just wanted to welcome my fellow commissioners to the uh, discussion and debate we've been living and breathing at the neighborhood level for about five months now. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of touch on the comment that um, Commissioner Riley made, actually. Um, so I will say that my observation of the Summit Hill Board's approach here was to um, spend that time listening deeply and facilitating a community-wide conversation. Um, the, the first development meeting had over 300 residents attend and subsequent meetings were attended by tens to hundreds of people. Um, there was a, a, I think 100 comments were received before the board's consideration deadline plus 38 post um, and a public hearing was held. And essentially um, most of the names um, I see in this meeting are names I recognize and have heard from extensively. Um, I think it's fair to say that although it's a board of 20 people, there was, in my opinion, a, a genuine desire to to listen, to weigh. Um, and I know personally from speaking to several of those board members that um, they ended up voting uh, the way they did as a board. There, there was a split, um, but that was it was not an easy decision for anybody. Um, and um, when when Mr. Pirates talks about the process, when he talks about sort of the engagement that happened and the, the numerous accommodations that were made, um, obviously not height, but certainly um, other other um, attempts to sort of accommodate and reduce the impact of the building, that made a lot of difference, I think, to the way the district association vote turned out. Um, I don't think the association or its board members would have supported this project the way it was presented in March um, with, for example, commercial loading in the alley plus a garage entrance for 80 vehicles in the alley that would have blocked it and caused chaos and disruption versus, for example, moving that to the front. So. I, I wanted to at least preface and say that um, in terms of that engagement process, um, I, I, th I think it's fair to say that that um, the, these issues have been discussed and debated extensively. And um, despite the the balance of in the in the, in the neighborhood clearly being weighted against rather than for, um, the, the decision of the um, of those three councils was very much weighing all this up and trying to balance and, and engaging with a lot of the issues that we're now engaging with as a committee for the first time. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Riley, would you like to um, comment or at this time? Uh, yes, unless anyone else has anything they'd like to say, I'd like to sort of share my thoughts on why I will not be voting in favor of the motion. Uh, is that all right, Chair? Yes. OK. Um, so. Um, 
I am, uh, I'll just outline them for you all. Um, you know, there's this, like I, I think I, I said um, in my question and, and asked staff to consider this conflict between um, the 2006 uh, neighborhood plan um, and the related overlay district um, that I think was, um, you know, as uh, Ms. Uh, Sigler said, um, was trying to preserve some of the historic um, sort of development patterns of the commercial district that we know fondly as Grand Avenue. Um, and I, I think um, that conflict between this T3, um, you know, sort of the massing allowed under T3 um, and the um, other uh, kinds of uses and other things that are that are available to the a developer of any kind um, in a T3 district um, is um, not in keeping um, with both the spirit intent of the comprehensive plan, which, as I said earlier, um, is is the point from which all official controls of the municipality must flow. So sometimes people can pass it off as this visionary document that has no power, but in reality, it is sort of like the, the one ring to rule them all, um, if you will. And so um, therefore, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna support the motion um, because uh, when you look at finding three, um, is consistent with the permitted building height of 50 feet plus um, for the RM2 and uh, the B2 and B3 um, businesses uh, based on the existence of the overlay. Um, it's not consistent when you look at that and it's not consistent um, most specifically in finding four um, with the way the area has developed. Um, we have a, a relatively narrow street for a commercial corridor with transit on it in St. Paul. Um, it has a large population of pedestrian users, um, which is really great, um, but the scale and massing of this building doesn't match the way the area has developed. The way the area developed, um, you know, dates back uh, to the founding of St. Paul. Um, it's smaller, um, units, much like you see all across the rest of the commercial corridors in St. Paul, the ones in na my neighborhood that I can think of, you know, Payne and Arcade, um, all of which are working really hard. Uh, those neighborhood organizations are working really hard to get to a T2 um, zoning sort of throughout some of these commercial districts. Um, but there's no transit to support T3 zoning. There's no um, there's no planned transit. And one of the things that the T3 zoning intent and the description talk about is um, sort of high frequency planned um, uh, transit. And that's just not planned for Grand Avenue. It's not planned for Grand Avenue now. It's not planned for Grand Avenue in 2040. It's not planned for Grand Avenue in 2060. Um, it's planned for other places in St. Paul and therefore T3 is not the appropriate um, zoning for, for this. It's not consistent with the er way the area has developed, nor is it consistent with the way the area is forecasted and planned to develop according to the St. Paul 2040 plan. Um, and then, uh, let's see, what else? It's also not compatible um, uh, with, hang on, sorry, there's a lot going on here. Um, Got to find my other point. Um, oh, it's not compatible with the neighborhood neighboring properties as well. So um, yes, it's a mixed use transit street, but we're not talking about something like um, even East Seventh that has you know three or four buses going down it at a time, or the Riverview Corridor, or the um, anything associated with Rush Line. Um, so I also find that. Um, Finding five, it's not consistent with the land use chapter of the comprehensive plan, not the ones that are mentioned. And I have a list more, which you know, if we get there, I can I can address them for folks. But um, there's a there's a lot that's not consistent. So those are some of the reasons. Uh, findings three, four, five, um, six, seven, um, eight, and nine. I find that. Um, there's not consistency there. And if we get to it, I have uh, the documentation to back that up. So thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I am now closing um, the time frame for discussion uh, before we vote. And so I will call up what will be our last two uh, comments on, on this um, as commissioners before we vote. Commissioner DeJoy and then Commissioner Hood, and then we will vote. Thank you, Chair Baker. I'll, keep, I'll make this quick. Um, during the public testimony, I heard a considerable number of uh, comments noting that the opposition was more about the size, the massing, and the density of the development. I just only heard a few comments that people were specifically opposed to T3 zoning, generally because they didn't view the Grand Avenue as a transit corridor. So um, since we're voting, and I appreciated the reminder on what we're voting for, since we're voting on the zoning change, um, and because of comments that people said, I'm not opposed to development, I'm leaning towards supporting the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner DeJoy. Um, Commissioner Hood. Thank you, Chair Baker. Uh, I want to thank everyone in the public for commenting. It's clear that <clears throat> they're very passionate about their neighborhood. Um, thanks for the developer for bringing this proposal forward. It's clear that they're also very interested and passionate about the neighborhood. Um, Ultimately, uh, I think it's a thoughtful proposal and the developer and the property owners have done a good job engaging the community. Did they make every concession that the neighborhood wanted? No, but on a lot of the other issues they did, uh, I would hate to see their architectural fees. Uh, I think that the uh, Summit Hill Association has done a great job on engagement and a big hat tip to Commissioner Tagioff, who's been continually engaged on this issue. Uh, I want to thank him for his work on this. Um, I think the SHA is in a tough spot. Uh, ultimately, uh, it's 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 interesting to see their support, and that's really what put me over the top on uh, on this issue and uh, all the work that they did. Uh, also, uh, to the staff, uh, I'll try to be brief, but I wanted to talk on the transit issue that a lot of people seem to bring up. So, if you talk to Metro Transit and you say, "I want a new transit line. I want high speed transit," they'll look at you and they'll say. Show us the people, show us the riders, show us that you're upzoning the corridor, show us that you're doing things in this area to justify transit. And if you don't do those things, you're not going to get it. So it, it really is kind of this, um, it's a weird situation where to justify the density, many people want the transit, but you can't get the transit unless you, know, you, you start to make those moves. So um, the fact that there's not transit here, I think there are a lot of alternatives and if we want good transit, if this corridor starts to develop, Metro Transit is going to be that that much more likely to bring it to St. Paul and specifically bring it to Grand Avenue. Um, so just kind of final comments here. Uh, after reading the staff report, the materials proposed, uh, reading through all the neighborhood comments, both for and against, and including watching a, a, a pretty good video on uh, YouTube that somebody sent. Uh, I believe that the proposed T3 zoning specifically is consistent with how the area is developed. It's consistent with the land use chapter. It's consistent with the housing chapter. It's consistent with the 2006 Summit Hill District 60 neighborhood plan. And I think it's frankly compatible with the neighboring usage. Um, so it's my opinion that this rezone is uh, it's a reasonable one and one that this uh, committee should support. So I concur with the recommendations of uh, the staff. Um, thank you, uh, Commissioner Hood. I will have last word on this one and then we will vote. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone that participated today. Thank you um, for all those in the public that have provided comments. Um, I also want to thank my uh, colleagues uh, consistently staying engaged in the, um, during these um, pretty technical um, conversations and um, really providing perspectives. And this is why you are um, on the committee. Um, a few things. One is um, I just glad that Commissioner Joy uh, raised the the point again that ultimately our job today is around rezoning. Um, it is not about the variances. It's not about the CUP. And to me, that that is important. And it remains important. Number two, I do think that there are some opportunities. And first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to. Um, the developer, so the applicant, thank you for um, engaging the public. Thank you for connecting with Summit Hill Association. And the one thing I will say about uh, Summit Hill Association, even though they may not, um, and this is to all district councils, they may not always um, consistently represent kind of one for one the, um, the community or the neighborhood. 
um, is what we have and it is what we use as a recommendation. And I want to still say that we use those as recommendations and they do hold weight um, in this committee as we are deliberating and making a decision. Um, the other thing is, is I, I was saying that I want to thank the um, developer for engaging with the community and uh, um, making uh, changes to the initial proposal um, because my understanding from the developer is that there were changes. Um, I do think, and uh, this has always been a touchy subject um, to my colleagues, because we've had these conversations before in the past around when a developer come to us and we start asking questions around um, uh, changing the size um, of the project, um, they come back to us and bring up about feasibility, um, uh, about cost, um, especially when, I mean, we'll get into this later, but especially uh, potentially at a later time, um, if and or when this um, the CUP or variance comes before us, um, but around um, support from the city um, in being able to do um, some of those things. So I just want to say that um, from my understanding, the developer is um, doing what they need to do. I do think, however, there is opportunity still when it comes to the variances in the CUP for there to be um, even more um, uh, engagement and opportunities to hear uh, the community. Um, I understand that um, the community members are concerned about the size, um, overall scope of this project, um, and they are the ones that will be living in this neighborhood um, with the effects of um, this project. So I want to make sure that we are listening to them and there potentially will be an opportunity. Um, and I want to say to staff, uh, maybe we can talk offline of well, what can and how can the developer still work with the community uh, moving forward on um, this next leg, which is the CUP and variances, because there to me is still some work that can be done. Um, but because of that, I do uh, plan to vote in favor. That said, uh, Samantha, can we vote, please? Commissioner Hood. Yes. Commissioner Said. Yes. Commissioner Riley. Commissioner Riley. I. I just want to say that one thing I appreciate about everybody is that um, when this is all said and done, we all get the work done. So thank you, and my vote is no. Commissioner Tegia? Yes. Commissioner Grill? Yes. Commissioner DeJoy? Yes. Commissioner Rangel Morales? No, for the reasons articulated by Commissioner Riley. And Chair Baker. Yes. Um, Samantha, did you hear Commissioner Grill? I don't know what she said. I thought I heard yes. OK, I just wanted to. Yeah, very faintly. Oh. Uh, six in favor, two of. All right, that motion passes. Uh, thank you to all those that participated. Thank you, staff, uh, Ms. Sigward, the applicant, all of the um, um, members of the public that provided um, comments during the public hearing. We appreciate um, you engaging in this, um, talking about this project. And um, with that, I think that that is the last item for today. Um, thank you for your time and please have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank Take you, care. Chair. Thank you, Chair.